I guess I don't know. Yeah, we're only missing one. Right. Good evening. Um, my name is Beth Margison. I'm Who's the vice president? chair and acting chair for the night for the Zoning Board of Adjustment meeting. Uh, welcome to the December 20th meeting. Uh, the, um, just before we start, I do want to make a few announcements. Um, uh, I want to honor and thank our departing ch aide from the Portsmouth Planning Department, Peter Stith, who is going to be moving on to serve the planning board. Um, he has been an incredibly valuable staff member, very knowledgeable, a steady hand, and um, we wish him well in his new assignment. The planning board is very lucky to have him, and uh, we're sorry to Thank lose him, but good luck. And the next thing is the introduction of our new aide, who is Stephanie Casella. She is from the, she's the current aide to the planning board, and she is going to be our new aide going forward um, starting in January. So I want to welcome um, Stephanie to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and then just two more announcements. We welcome back to the board David Rayum, um, who is our new but slash old member. So welcome back to David Rayum. And also I want to um, acknowledge the service of Jim Lee, who was not reappointed to the board, but served on this board for I think at least five years, five years. Um, and served well, and we thank him for his service, and we will miss him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So with those not so insignificant things out of the way, <laughs> well, now a, also a significant thing. So the first item on our agenda is uh, the election of officers, and uh, at the last meeting, uh, the vice chair was elected. That was me. I was here. Um, but so Jim Lee was actually uh, uh, was uh, elected chair. He is now no longer chair. So um, the office of chair is vacant. And so we are looking for um, nominations to fill the chair vacant. Uh, I'll make a motion to nominate Phyllis Eldridge as the chair of the BOA. Seconded. Thank you. Would you like Thank to... Um, Speak to your nomination. Uh, in my time, um, Phyllis has shown a great deal of deliberation. Uh, she doesn't get too exasperated unless motions are need to be made. And, I get the starey eyes down this way, but uh, I think she would make a wonderful chairman. Anything to your second, Mr. Rossi? Uh, yeah, it's also I've had the privilege of uh, working side by side with Phyllis on this board for the last year, and uh, Phyllis was very helpful to me in uh, acclimating uh, to the responsibilities and coached me quietly. Uh, uh, during and after uh, discussions. I found that very helpful, uh, and I know that she cares deeply about this uh, activity. Uh, I think she has a great presence, and I'm very happy to support her nomination. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just do want to note for people who are not familiar with Phyllis, she's going to kill me for doing this, but Phyllis has served this city as a city councilor on the planning board, on the historic district commission, and also as a trustee of the trust fund, as well as an employee of the Portsmouth School Department. She has a very long municipal history. So, um, I will need a roll call vote. I'll start down at this end. Paul Mantle, please. Yes. Mr. Rayum? Yes. Phyllis? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Rossi? Yes. Mr. Matson? Yes. And the acting chair votes yes. Anonymous six zero. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> but unfortunately, I still need to run the meeting for the night, so I'm sorry yes, for everybody. You do. <laughs> but uh, we actually, Mr. Mantle cannot leave. Oh, he's okay. Um, so the next uh, order of business is the approval. Right. Oh, just a point of order. Should we also uh, elect for a vice chair for next year? Uh, that's me. I was elected at the last meeting. Okay. Yeah. So we did, um, because we had vacancies, we had the vice chair and the chair last election, mm -hmm. last in November, 
and um, the uh, I was elected vice chair, and Jim Lee was elected elected chair. So the vacancy was with Jim Lee's chair. Understood. Just normally for the new calendar year, there's a there's a new uh, election of of both officers for the calendar year. In my experience, so just throwing that out there. Okay. All right. Well, I think I mean we did it last week last month mm -hmm. because um, we had vacancies with the expectation that that was the the election of the officers for the new calendar year. Okay. We've lost two chairmen in three months. I know. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't look good so, for us so, just wait. So. <laughs> don't want to go another meeting without a chairman. Yeah. But, all right, so the next order of business is the approval of the minutes, the approval of the November 15, 2022 minutes. I was not here. Uh, David Rayan was not here. So um, does anybody have a motion, anything? Um, that needs I have one minor correction. And that is? On page two. The second paragraph under speaking to the petition, uh, the first sentence reads, Mr. Rossi asked if the front yard setback, as always, 15.5 feet, mm. uh, it should read, was always 15.5 feet. Okay. Thank you. We'll make that change. Are you taking that down? Okay. Are there any other corrections, additions? Okay. If I could please have a, a motion. I move to approve the minutes as corrected. And is there a second? A second. Okay. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Okay. The minutes are approved. Six to zero. And then the next order in the agenda is um, we have a request for hearing, but before we get to that, uh, we have two requests to postpone tonight. They're both uh, for Sagamore Avenue. One is 6 to 53 Sagamore Avenue. 35. 635, sorry, Sagamore Avenue. The next one is 915 Sagamore Avenue. Oh. So, um, and the reason for the request to postpone are that there would be um, five members right. because um, Mr. Rossi has to recuse on both of those applications. That is correct. So, um, do I have a motion from the? Make the motion to request uh, to postpone item B and item G. And do we have a second on that? Second. And uh, is there any? You know, any requests further? to postpone are um, typical and we grant them. <laughs> Um, and uh, can I have a uh, just a, not a roll call vote, but all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And the next thing is 4446 Rockingham Street. I don't know if anybody is here that can speak to that con that petition that application. Um, it's item J on our our agenda tonight, and uh, Mr. Rayum um, has to recuse on that application leaving the board with only five members and when that happens we give the applicant the option of um, postponing their application so i don't know you'll proceed okay all righty all right so now we'll go to old business and the first um the first and only item for old business is the request for here rehearing of 53 green street this is an application, a, a, um, a rehearing that this board did in October, um, and we <coughs> have received a request for rehearing on it. The, you know, the ZBA um, is allowed to rehear its own, its own um, decisions if they find that, if we find that uh, error of fact or misapprehension of the law was made or that they, you know, any member believes that there's anything that needs to be revisited um, and needs to be reheard. So with that in mind, uh, with that out of the way, uh, does anybody want to speak to that? This will not be in a public hearing. Um, we will not be rehearing the application tonight. Um, it's just whether or not to rehear it at our next meeting or another scheduled meeting. Uh, I would only like to say that uh, <laughs> this has already been heard twice by the board. Uh, two different on those two different occasions there were there was different board composition uh, the result has been the same both times uh, and even though I was in the minority uh, in my opinion uh, when it was last heard I don't see anything in here 
that would uh, induce me to think it should be reheard. And is that a motion? <laughs> or would anybody else like to be heard before we make any kind of motion? Well, then, yes, it's a motion. My, my move to deny the request for a rehearing. Is there a second? A second. Okay. And I just do want to note for the record that Mr. Rayum was not sitting on this board at the time that we reheard this application. Um, uh, David, if you could just speak to uh, uh, how you'll be able to vote on this request for rehearing, please. Yeah, so I've reviewed all of the information provided uh, by uh, both parties who have uh, submitted information regarding the request for rehearing. I did have an opportunity to go back and rewatch the uh, the last meeting. Uh, I wouldn't say in its entirety, but uh, some substantial portions of it. Certainly uh, um, focusing on the deliberation of the board um, and my impression uh, that the uh, the board um, did a full deliberation. Uh, heard uh, the information that was being provided by all parties, and uh, I would. I, my thought is, I would tend to agree with the uh, with the motion that has been put forward. Okay, so could we have a roll call vote on this, please? And uh, I'll start down at this end. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey. So a yes is uh, to uh, deny to the deny the request for yes. rehearing. Mr. Rossi. Yes. Ms. Eldridge. Yes. Mr. Rayum. Yes. Mr. Mantle? Yes. And the vice chair, acting chair votes yes. Okay. And now we'll move on to the next, the new business part of the hearing. Um, the first application that we will hear is the request of Ann R. Sherpik and Walter F. Stewart, owners for property located at 88 Kensington Road, whereas relief is needed to remove an existing addition and construct a new addition which requires the following. Number one, a variance from section 10.521 to allow building coverage where 20% is the maximum allowed. Number two, a variance from section 10.321 to allow a non-conforming building or structure to be extended, reconstructed, or enlarged without conforming to the requirements of the ordinance. Said property is located on assessor map 152, lot 22, and lies within the single residence B district. Um, and if I, I didn't say so before, but the applicant is given 15 minutes to present their case. And then after that, a public hearing is start is opened uh, where those who, who, for those to speak to, for, or against the application. So could, uh, who speaks to this application tonight? My name is Amy Dutton. I am the designer on the project representing Ann Sherpik and Walter Stewart. I work out of Kittery and live in Portsmouth. So, okay. good evening. I've never been first, so <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time I've been in front of this board. So um, tonight we are just going to I'm just going to read through this, and then you can ask me answer out answer questions. Um, the overall gist of the project is there is an existing structure that to the left side of the property that is was built in a probably by a homeowner is my guess that it's falling off the foundation. Um, we are going to keep the width or the length of that structure, but remove that, pour a new foundation and go five more feet, which takes us to the 10 foot setback. And that structure that is existing is unconditioned. It's a sunroom and um, you step down into it. So what we're trying to do is with the addition is actually connected to uh, an existing small living room and make that a larger living space and dining space and then taking the first floor um, dining space and making that more uh, kitchen area, mud room, so more modern family living. And then on the second floor, we capture that space as a primary bedroom and um, rearrange some space to get another bathroom. Um, so ultimately, the layout of the house will be three bedrooms, two and a half baths. We gained a, a tiny little office um, and expanding that first floor living space. So that's a, just a quick overview, just to review the variances. Um, we 
do feel that the variance would not be contrary to public interest. In order to comply to building code, we will stay within our required setback, specifically on that left side. In the spirit of the ordinance, we will be, the spirit of the ordinance will be observed. Uh, what we are proposing is to, like I said, remove remove something that is not structurally sound and gain that space on the um, first and second floor. There was an error in my uh, narrative that was submitted. Um, we went back and we drew it a few times, um, but trying to make our dollar go where it needs to go and make the house perform the way that a family of five needs it to. Um, substantial justice will be done. We are required 20% lot coverage and we are currently at 21%, so we're expanding that to 23% by adding that five extra square feet. And um, we do believe that the neighborhood is, it's a sweet neighborhood. I hope you all know it well because it's kind of tucked back in off of Middle Road. And um, a lot of the houses have been renovated and some of them have not. So I do feel like this is an improvement to the neighborhood and kind of helping ushering the neighborhood into that next um, decade or lifetime of the house. Um, it has not been worked on in, I don't know. Um, I'm guessing the 30s, <laughs> maybe the 50s, but it's um, it's been in some, it needs some work, some help. Um, the value of the surrounding properties will not be diminished. We strongly feel that this renovation would improve the other property values. And the literal enforcement of the provision of the ordinance would, not, would result in a hardship. Um, we feel that this existing structure is a small, modest home located in an equally small, modest lot. The lot itself is shaped in a strange way with neighbors kind of close on each side. And um, we wanted to be respectful to not encroach on that setback. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting lot, as you can see, the neighbor to the left is, um, their lot is sort of shaped around it. Um, so that we will be able to maintain the exact same backyard and for gardening and outdoor dining. And then ultimately, you know, it's my, what I always say to my clients is we like to love our houses back to life and really get, um, move the house forward and help it live a better life. So do you have questions? Uh, I do have one question. Uh, when I was looking at the property earlier today, there's a whole bunch of pink flags out by the area, you know, uh, the sunroom or whatever it's called. Yeah. Uh, but they look like they went right up to the lot line. Th those pink flags, I guess, are not. Do you know what they are? Those are a dog. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering. So I was like, boy, that looks like it's not the 10-foot setback. Okay, cool. Thank you. Glad I didn't have my shock collar on. <laughs> Uh, any more questions from the board? Okay. Um, is there anyone here to speak to, for, or against the application? So. I live across the street. I think it would look great. Yeah, I'm sorry. You'll have to come up to the podium and introduce yourself and give your address, please. <laughs> <laughs> Did you also receive a letter? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've got the about letter. Yes, we have received public comment on this meeting, but I have to see if there's anyone here who wants to speak. Hi, uh, sorry, I'm uh, Christine Powell. I live across the street, um, and I love the house. Uh, Ken, Linda, we're my neighbors, and Ann and Buzz just moved in, and I think that addition and fixing up the sunroom would be absolutely beautiful. Um, and I'm not upset about, you know, increasing house value, so. <laughs> could you please okay. state your address? I know you live across the street. Sure, you... uh, 71 Kensington Road. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone here else that would like to speak to the application? Two, four, against? Hearing none, I will close the public hearing. 
and open it up to deliberation by the board. Any discussion or a motion? <laughs> you want to do it I'll make again? the motion. <laughs> Um, make the motion to approve um, item A as presented. Seconded. As to the criteria, uh, section 10.233.21. I find as a finding of fact that granting the, granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest. Granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance. Granting the variance would do substantial justice. Looking at the application, uh, everything else is in the zoning except for a 1.5% increase in the building coverage, which in my estimation is small. As far as 10.233.24, granting the variance would not diminish surrounding property values. If anything, I believe is a finding of fact, it would increase because now we have a renovated house with more room. And as the neighbor eloquently stated, she is all in favor of this. And lastly, granted uh, 10.233.25, literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship. I believe this to be true. Um, let's see. Yeah, impos imposing the strict building coverage on this would be an unnecessary hardship in my estimation. I think we're going to need a little more detail there. <laughs> so what special conditions uh, I, of this property? I, I, I can do that in okay. my second. <laughs> All right. And there you go. So uh, with regard to 10.233.25, I think the special condition of the property is that it is has a very small area of 6,098 square feet. Uh, where the required area is 15,000, so it's already non-conforming. Uh, the change uh, that's being suggested maintains the lot, clear, lot line clearance, uh, but because of the small uh, square footage available in the lot, uh, it easily goes over the 20% maximum permitted building coverage. Uh, <coughs> I think this use is quite reasonable for the property, uh, and that's those are my findings of fact in... Uh, support of uh, 10.233.25. And as to the first two, 10.233.21 and 10.33.22, granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest and it would observe the spirit of the ordinance. Uh, do we have findings of fact for those two? Uh, hold on for one second. We will. This is in which zoning district again? Single, um, SRB. SRB. Single residence. So SRB, uh, the purpose of that is to provide areas for single family dwellings at low to medium densities, uh, approximately one to three dwellings per acre and appropriate accessory uses. Uh, this is a single family dwelling. It's not being changed from that use, and so uh, granting the variance would be consistent with the spirit of the ordinance. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything to add? I'd also add that if uh, this lot size was the required minimum size, uh, they wouldn't need the variance for the uh, coverage, so that it is in the spirit of the ordinance. Thank you. All right, so we'll start with a roll call vote. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I think we'll go you, over this way. <laughs> I, I, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would support the motion um, in terms of the um, finding of facts associated with the uh, um, public interest and the um, spirit of the ordinance. 
Um, looking through this neighborhood, uh, there's really the adjacent property right next door on the right-hand side actually has an addition that appears to be almost identical to what the uh, applicant is proposing. And then there's a, uh, a similarly sized uh, home on the other side. So it's not like the, the, what the applicant is asking for, even with the very small amount of relief that's being requested here um, is, is out of the ordinary and I think is well within the expectations for allowing this board to grant it. So I will support the motion. Okay, thank you. And we'll do with a roll call vote. Um, I'll start with Mr. Mal. Yes. Mr. Rayum? Yes. Ms. Eldridge? Yes. Mr. Rossi? Yes. Mr. Matson? Yes. And the acting chair votes yes. Motion passes uh, six to zero. No, so? Yep. Yeah, six to zero. Okay, thank you. You have your approval. Thank you. The next application is the request of Ryan and Karen e. Baker owners for property located at 44 Gardner Street, whereas relief is needed to replace an existing porch with a sunroom addition, which requires the following. One, a variance from section 10.521 to allow 40, I'm sorry, to allow 34% building coverage where 30% is the maximum allowed. Number two, a variance from section 10.321 to allow a non-conforming building or structure to be extended, reconstructed, or enlarged without conforming to the requirements of the ordinance. Said property is located on Assessor Map 103, Lot 42, and lies within the General Residence B and Historic District. And who is here to speak to this application? Uh, good evening, members of the board. My name is Ryan Baker, and I'm the new homeowner of 44 Gardner Street. Okay, thank you. You may proceed. <clears throat> Um, okay, uh, my name again, my name is Ryan Baker and my wife and I purchased the property just a few months ago in August of 2022. Uh, this application probably looks familiar to you uh, because the project was approved by the ZBA and the HDC in April of 2020. Unfortunately for us, uh, the approval expired earlier this year in April of 2022. Uh, that being said, we are resubmitting the application to construct the sunroom or four season porch, which would replace an existing porch and this new sunroom would provide rear access from the yard and the driveway. Uh, the existing building coverage is 32.6% and I am asking to increase that coverage to 33.8 or by 1.2% of note, 30% coverage is allowed in this area. Um, I want to point out that I made a few minor updates to the original plans, which include adjusting the location of the exterior stairs and placement slash design of some of the windows. Uh, if you re read through the criteria of the variance, you'll notice nothing has changed, and I'm hopeful that you will reapprove this application. Uh, would you like me to read through the, the five criteria? Yes, please. Okay. Um, the variance, number one, the variances are not contrary to public interest and in that it will not affect the adjacent properties. The additions are not visible. The addition is not visible from Gardner Street and the views from both Mechanic and Hunking Streets are not adversely affected. Number two, the variances are consistent with the spirit of the ordinance in that it will allow these modest, this modest addition without impacting the immediate abutters. Substantial justice will be done as this work will allow the owner, myself, to improve the property without adversely affecting the adjacent properties. Number four, these var the variances will not diminish the value of the surrounding properties and, have, and we have had the support of the neighbors and the, uh, this project has had the support of the neighbors in the past based on prior approvals. And I have a few recent emails of support from my neighbors that I can hand out to you guys uh, for this as well tonight. And number five, the special condition of this property is that the lot size and the, and the current building coverage and the nonconformity of the existing residents. That's all I have. Okay. Does the board have any questions for the applicant? Mr. Ryu? I, I actually have a question for uh, city staff, if, if that's okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so um, the, there was also a, a board action. It kind of seems like this comes before us annually. So we had the 2020, I understand, which expired. But in September of 2021, it, similar um, variances were, were granted as well. What, what was the nature of those variances? And um, why are they not applicable to this case? So those, there was the initial sunroom request, which is similar to this one. Um, and then the prior owners came back again with a different location for a mudroom on the side of the house. Um, that 
variance is actually still valid, but a building permit has not been pulled on it. Um, assuming the applicant gets this approval, um, you know he couldn't pull he couldn't pull a building permit for both because the building coverage would go way up. Go so. over. <clears throat> yeah, I, that one's still valid, I think, at the moment um, until. 2023 at some point in right. the middle, middle of the year. Um, I do plan to resubmit that one. That was approved as well. Um, but I would change the location of the mudroom and, and, and itself. So it would be a net new application. Okay. According to the notes, did the board grant anything in September 2021? Yes, that, mm -hmm. that was granted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So I'm just now I'm getting confused. So you're right, saying right. that you are going to be pulling a building building permit for the variance that was granted last year? No, no, that so no, um, that was approved by the previous owner, the mudroom. So there's a sunroom, which is I'm, I'm here tonight for and then there's a mudroom that's already approved. That is a separate application that is still valid or a separate approval that's been approved by the ZBA and the HTC. I do, I, I am not gonna go forward with that particular one because of where they put the actual mudroom. It's actually right in the driveway and I, I'm not gonna go forward with that actual project. So- And I'm gonna resubmit for a new mudroom in a different location. Well, then I think we've got a problem. Well, so I think he's gonna submit a completely new application um, both for a different mudroom and then that will increase the building coverage on top of what is being asked tonight um, but we can make that judgment when we see it right that's, what I, make mean, that that's what I mean that's what I mean it would be a um, separate submission I think would you rather do them all as one <laughs> we can um, if that's something you, you'd want to do I may never do that that's the thing this is more important to me than that one it's understood point. Understood, but if you already said you're going to come back to either remove or change the location of the mud room, yep. why wouldn't you do it? Do both at the same time? Because honestly, I want to. I would like to move forward with this project, okay. get this one completed, okay. and then live in the house for a little bit longer than say three months that I've I've been there to make sure that that's the right decision, mm -hmm. um, and and really plan it out the right way by putting them both together it kind of forces me to rush through it and i really don't want to rush this project i want to move forward that's this is the one i'd like to do. so in, in other words what you're first. saying is you would do this project whether or not you got another variance yes allowed. okay that's good yep that's cool i think that makes sense okay Heidi, thank you any other questions questions from somebody else on the board Thank you very much. Is there anyone here to speak to, for, or against the application? Can I give you the emails? Do you want to see them? Y yes, I think we already have them. But... I never gave them these to you. But... Okay. Do we have anyone on Zoom? Uh, thank you. Is there anyone on Zoom? Okay. Alrighty. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, seeing no one rise, I'll close the public hearing. There's and... one for each of us. So, uh, discussions, motions by any member of the board? Thank you. Are there any thoughts? Is anyone ready to make a motion? Sorry. Now I know why. Arthur used to look this way. <laughs> 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 Sorry. I would let um, Ms. Pinnell do it. Um, I would move approval of this of this um, petition. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. okay. Ms. Elders, your motion, please. Yes. The um, the change that they're asking for is so minor. Even you know. 30% lot coverage was 33 for many, many years, and now it's 34. It's barely a difference anybody would notice. Um, so granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest because there is really no change to a building that has been there happily for a long time. 
um, observes the spirit of the ordinance, it's the keeping with the neighborhood, nothing is going to change, and it would do substantial justice as it would provide the owner with what they want without any effect on other people in the neighborhood. Um, if it affects the property values at all, I would think that it would be in a positive manner. And literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship. There is um, nobody who would be hurt by what would be a serious benefit to the owners of this property. And therefore, I think it would be reasonable that we approve this petition. But I forgot. And your second, Mr. Ram? Uh, in addition to agreeing with all of Ms. Eldridge's comments, um, I, just in general, I'm normally kind of hesitant to let an applicant come back a second time and bite at the apple if they really are looking for a total relief of more than what they're asking for tonight. I would normally be hesitant to say, you can have this now and then come back and ask for more later. We, we have seen that as a board in the past where you know, an applicant kind of keeps kind of coming back and, oh, I just want a little bit more. Oh, I just want a little bit more. Oh, I just want a little bit more. Um, that said, I do think that the applicant here as a new homeowner, um, still trying to get to understand this property. I do think that it is a reasonable request to get uh, this application approved tonight. And then potentially if the homeowner sees uh, some other improvements that they need to their home, coming back and asking for additional relief in the same respect, which is the, the total lot coverage. Um, I would just add a couple of things um, in terms of uh, findings of facts uh, relative to granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest. Uh, the portion of the home that's being affected here is away from uh, any of the streetscape, so it's really not impacting the overall uh, look and feel of the neighborhood. Um, the, the, the fact that they are just barely slightly over the total coverage requirements, again, in a relatively dense neighborhood, um, I, I don't think is going to be noticed. So uh, certainly in keeping with uh, both uh, the public interest and the, uh, the spirit of the ordinance. And then, um, you know, we, we have previously approved this as a board uh, as well um, with this, again, relatively small amount of, uh, of coverage increase. And uh, so with that, I, I would recommend approval. Okay. Thank you. Any more comments? Okay. We'll take a roll call vote. And this time we will start with Mr. Matson. Yes. Mr. Rossi. Yes. Ms. Eldridge. Yes. Mr. Rayum. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Mantle? Yes. And the acting chair votes yes. Your application is approved. 6 0. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next application. It is uh, the request of Karen and Rick Rosania. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Owners for property located at 32 Boss Avenue, whereas relief is needed to allow an art studio for classes up to eight people, which requires the following. One, a variance from section 10.440 to allow an art studio where the use is not permitted. Said property is located on assessor map 153, lot 5, and lies within the single residence B district. Um, and who is here to speak to this application? Uh, yes, my name is Karen Rosania, and together with my husband, we own 32 Boss Ave. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Yes. Sorry yes, for mispronouncing you. your name. Nope, that was close. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, so I just want to say um, hello, happy holidays to everybody, and I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to present this evening. Uh, so as I mentioned, my husband and I own 32 Boss Ave. Uh, I am also the owner and an artist of Olive Teal Arts, uh, which is a new art studio business that I started up earlier this summer. My art studio is fully contained uh, within our home, and I am seeking a variance this evening to allow adults and children to come into my studio for small art classes. My studio is already fully constructed, furnished, and passed a full building inspection last year when we did a home remodel. I'm very passionate about the arts and Portsmouth, and this is really the primary reason why we relocated to Portsmouth. My commitment to the arts, um, even, in my, even my own business as well, is for the long term. So even my request coming today is not a uh, short term stint here, but rather a, a long term request. And it really does tie, tie nicely into the fact that I was just voted into the Portsmouth Arts and Nonprofits Committee by City Council, uh, which I'm very excited about that opportunity to help shape 
the future um, of the arts culture in the city of Portsmouth. So my point being that this, this is long term. This is my second chapter in my life and something I'm very excited to bring to this city. So I thought I would start by sharing why I believe I meet the criteria for this variance, followed by pictures of the exterior of our property. Uh, then I'll take you on a, a, I guess, a virtual tour inside my studio. And I would also like to address issues that I'm sure is on uh, individuals' minds, such as parking, traffic, and noise. So I thought I would start if um, we could bring up the five criteria, and then I'll get into actually the pictures, if, if that might be OK. So again, with my business proposal is really to offer small scale art classes in my existing home studio to adults and children and actually individuals with different abilities as well from the community. My studio can accommodate a total of eight people. That includes me. However, I expect many of my classes to be more in the range of four to six people uh, just so I can provide individualized attention uh, to the participants of my classes. I propose offering these classes between the hours of 11, roughly 11 and 5 p.m., maybe one or two classes per day, Monday through Friday. And to best accommodate working adults, I'd like to propose offering classes one to two evenings a week, roughly maybe 6 to 9 p.m., and one day on the weekends, let's say maybe 11 to 1 p.m. So as I go through the five criteria for this variance, I do believe, in fact, I meet all of them. Uh, starting with the variants will not be contrary to public interest. Portsmouth has a deep-rooted culture in the arts, as we all know. And even part of the mission of Port, Port, Portsmouth 400, as we embark upon that for next year, is to engage and promote local artists, historians, and diverse communities. And I had the chance to really engage with several local artists uh, and art centers in the area, and I believe my areas of focus will be complementary uh, and collaborative with other nearby offerings and vice versa. My art studio will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or threaten the health, safety, or general welfare of the public. And I do believe that my art studio will allow members of the community to express and explore artistic interests that will actually be favorable uh, to the public. The spirit of the ordinance will be observed. The welfare of the community will be enhanced by providing exciting and complementary art offerings. Substantial justice will be done. I believe there will be substantial benefit to the community by taking art classes with Olive Teal Arts. I have received tremendous positive feedback from several local nonprofits. Um, this is very much a part of my mission today and well into the future. Uh, is to really get back to the community. And I have been teaching off-site for the last several months at places like the Portsmouth Senior Activity Center and the um, Arts and Reach, and I've had very, very positive feedback. So very committed to fostering an inclusive, relaxing, patient, and encouraging environment for my students. The value of surrounding properties will not be diminished. As I said, my studio is already fully constructed, furnished, and completely contained within our home. And Portsmouth has a strong culture for the arts and numerous local art studios. Therefore, I do not see any diminished value for surrounding properties. And literal enforcement of this provision of the ordinance would result in unnecessary hardship. There would be a hardship to me, um, because if my variance is not approved, it will significantly impact impact my ability to earn a living and run a small business in Portsmouth. But I think most importantly, there would be a missed opportunity for the community um, if the variants were not approved. So just moving into now some of the pictures that I submitted, uh, just to orient you in terms of where our property is located in the West End. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to point out here. First of all, I think we are blessed, um, especially by Portsmouth, standards to have a significant amount of on-street parking right outside of our house. We have 155 linear feet of parking. Uh, I don't think you even have to be a good parallel parker, <laughs> but even by Portsmouth standards, again, you could probably fit a good five to six cars in directly in front of my house, and that accounts for even coming in 10 feet from the side property lines that we could still fit that many vehicles. And then we could probably fit about four cars in our driveway as well. 
Um, I'd also like to say, again, if this variance is approved, I will be reinforcing uh, to my fellow students to park directly in front of our house or in our driveway, uh, and I can reinforce that through various communication channels. In terms of traffic, um, as you can see, there are three ways to get to our home, either coming down Sunset, coming off of Aldridge, or coming uh, th from Lawrence onto Boss. I don't anticipate traffic to be an issue at all. The next slide uh, showing our, our property itself, and I just wanted to orient you in terms of where my studio is, it's over there on the far right of the property. And the reason I'm also showing this particular slide is that if I am granted the variance, I would like to put in a, a porous brick walkway just for convenience leading up to my art studio. Uh, this will follow the natural configuration of our front lawn. I emphasize that again, it is porous. It will match the brick walkway that we have already leading to our front entry. The reason why, for the next slide, I'm bringing that to your attention. Um, we do live on wetlands, and a good bit of our property is also in the wetlands buffer. This is a bit of an eye chart. Um, this is all work that's been approved. We've already been through conservation. The work has all been complete. The only reason I'm showing this to you is just that we've really tried to be good stewards of the conservation and the wetlands. You see a lot of the work we did additionally in terms of adding 25 wetland trees, planting wetland seed mix and wildflower mix and installing a rain garden. And again, I'm just showing that to you because where we would have the proposed brick walkway if the variance is approved is really on the outer, the outskirts. It's, it's, when, it's within the buffer, but it's the outside edge of the buffer um, fully in front of the house. But I just wanted to make that known. And if we move into the next slide, I'm going to take you now into my studio. This will all move pretty quickly. Uh, again, it's on the far right side of the house there. The studio itself is 216 square feet. Uh, when we had the house remodeled, I did, I did add an ensuite bathroom for convenience, bringing up the total to 248 square feet for the bath and the studio. I figured this would be a good point to also talk about noise. Uh, so again, my studio will be fully contained. Uh, the, the number of people that I'm expecting or, or uh, what I would desire in my classes would really be similar to a small family gathering. So I expect the noise to be pretty much minimal or non-detectable. What I do hope you might be hearing and even noise I can you know, keep to a minimum is, is laughter. And I think <coughs> we could all use that right now and just uh, people enjoying themselves and learning uh, new art forms. I am a very considerate and responsive person, so clearly I would act quickly if there was any comments that came in from uh, nearby homes. And just now, again, taking you in my studio, um, I did design my studio, actually designed my entire house inside and out with the goal of making my studio a very relaxing and inspirational place to try different art forms. Next slide uh, just shows you that safety has always been at the forefront and is at the paramount of everything I do and certainly something I would be enforcing with my students. And you can see some of the things that we added when we did our house remodel. Um, it, it's all right there in terms of the smoke and uh, carbon monoxide detector. I have illuminated exit signs that I installed, fire extinguisher. Uh, two entrances, if you go to the next slide, you see that the exit signs are above both entrances. Next slide shows the ensuite bathroom. Next slide shows the exterior. Uh, I think there might be another slide that shows the bathroom. That shows the exterior lights that are wired to the exit sign. And then lastly, I did add a second set of exterior house numbers to my studio entrance. So I'm going to pause there, and um, I just respectfully ask the board for your consideration in proving my variance so that I may offer small classes to children and adults to come into my art studio. And at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any members of the board have any questions for the applicant? Mr. Rossi? Are you planning on having any outdoor storage of art materials or finished projects? No. Thank you. Uh, then I have a question for the planning. Department, why is this not a permitted use under 19.10, which is under 10.42, something or other? This whole chart that's in our 
Section 10.440, 10 yeah, 10 19.1, accessory use to permitted principal use but not including any outdoor storage. Why does that not uh, give this? Well, because it's a, it's a business use in the single residence zone. Mm -hmm. So that, that I would think not you, be considered. What you're referring to would be. Yeah, what, what is what is it? What is meant by this? Because I was trying to figure it out from the definitions in the um, back, and I couldn't get get there. So, well, I don't know. For residential use, it would be just something that's customarily accessory uh, accessory to um, residential use. And it wouldn't be any, covered under home occupation one, which is nineteen point two. Right. It, it didn't. It didn't qualify for home because there were people one. coming in for the classes. Right. Okay. So initially we talked about maybe getting a variance from the home occupation um, definition, but yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's clear it's cleaner to just request a, a use for the art studio where it's not permitted. So that's a variance, not a special, whatever it's called, for uh, a use, because uh, there's different criteria for the... This isn't a permitted use. Right, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't qualify as a home occupation because it doesn't okay. meet that criteria. So would have to be qualified as something else. But it's a variance, not a special exception. Right. right. It's a business use in a residential zone. Sorry, do you have any questions or concerns? I do. Um, so uh, looking at the uh, new studio area that you just constructed, it does appear like you have exit signs and a fire extinguisher. What was the basis for putting all of that in if you did not have an approved use for um, a business use? It's a good question. Um, this has been in my dream and in my second chapter <coughs> planning for many, many years. And I actually had a, a wonderful mentor who's an artist in Mont Vernon, uh, New Hampshire, who's a potter. And she went through all the appropriate channels within her town to get her art studio, which is attached to her house, approved and and she guided me as my husband husband and I were doing this remodel she said while you're doing the remodel while the electrician is there you might want to think about putting the exit signs in you might want to think about you know putting in your carbon monoxide so I will say I went at risk um, and and at my own at our own expense with with the hope that this would get approved at some point but I have not had any uh, classes in my space. All of my classes have been off-site. Okay. And uh, I guess that leads to my second question. I mean, you are asking, as has been pointed out here, to have a business use in an area that specifically prohibits any such business uses. Um, you are you know, you know, on the edge with another general residence district, but also no business uh, uses are allowed in that district either. Um, the intent is to separate residential from business. You're now kind of crossing that threshold. So why is it that you would want to have your um, ability to teach students in this location as opposed to finding a, an approved business location to open up a small art studio to go in and bring people in in a setting that it's designed for? Yeah, another good question. Um, again, I'll just say it's always been my dream to have my art studio attached to my house. It gave me the chance to design it from scratch. Um, a lot of the stuff in my studio has been repurposed or reused or refinished. Um, it allowed me to put my touch on it and my vibe on it and make it a space that was very inviting. And just, again, from purely a financial standpoint, I'm, I'm one person, and if, if I want to leave and travel for a couple weeks, I can turn the key and go you know, versus having to pay overhead and all that. And there are beautiful art spaces, and that was something that I considered. But for me, my preference is to be able to bring people into a studio that I, that I designed from scratch. Okay. And then in terms of uh, your illustration, I don't think the pages are numbered per se, but you do have an illustration that shows um, where you're thinking that you have four parking locations in your driveway. Again, you're now transitioning from a residential use to a business use. There are prescribed dimensions for uh, required for parking spaces for a business use. Um, do you have anything that provides further information on how those proposed parking spots that you're saying that you have there would actually meet the city's requirements for a, a parking space? And also, you know, we have like turning radius and whatnot, again, because you're transitioning from residential to a business use. 
I, I haven't thought, you know, I haven't been there. I haven't received guidance to get that specific. I mean, I was just roughly looking at the, the way we're able to park in our driveway and, and just kind of go from there. So I didn't have any specific measurements or things like that taken of our space. Um, my hope is that people could just park right out in front of our home too, uh, on our side of the street and that would not be interfering with other people trying to reach their homes or we have a pretty wide street. So I don't, I don't see that that would be a problem with other cars getting by. And then uh, lastly, so our hardship criteria, I, what you had written here, um, you basically said it's a hardship to you because it would impede your ability to earn a living and run a small business. However, our hardship criteria, the essence of it is, is what is unique about the property uh, relative to other properties. So what is the hardship of the, of the property itself, um, not necessarily what your situation is. Do you have anything that you could add in, in respect to what is it about your property that says that you are different than your, all your neighbors um, if they wanted to go and start up their own businesses? Uh, why is your property unique? I mean, they can start their own businesses. People have local businesses. Um, I'm just trying to do I don't, I don't know, again, I'm just trying to fulfill a dream and bring people, bring people in and inspire and be inspired. Okay, and I, if I may answer. Uh, one more question for city staff. Um, you had um, in, in the notes, you said that from a parking requirements standpoint, you had, um, in, in the absence of art studio, you had said that you went with health studio, for all, I didn't find health studio in the list of well, um, applicable. It's um, it was like a yoga. Studio right, I think, or something. Something. I think it's I think it's health club. Health club. Okay. What, what was the inspiration for choosing that as as an attempt? Obviously, we're, we're kind of in uncharted territory. There is right. no um, there is no allowed use per the zoning ordinance here. Well, the one space per two hundred fifty square feet is typically um, the lowest. Um, or the highest requirement um, so I figured that that would be and it's only 250 square feet so there's nothing I don't think that's less than that as far as square footage in the parking okay um, <clears throat> and my one last question for city staff is was there any discussion of uh, 10113.42 uh, 1113.42 which talks about in residential districts if you're using home occupation which again um, we don't really have anything to go by here, but it does require that um, for that kind of use, which um, has probably even less, you know, standing parking, uh, you're required to have setbacks from uh, butters and screening. Um, so I was just wondering if there was any discussion or thoughts about uh, whether or not that would be applicable. There was no discussion about that, but the board could, could um, easily add those as conditions if they feel um, those setbacks or buffering screening is appropriate. Yeah, because we talked about a 10 feet from the side and rear property lines, which it appears, obviously we don't have any dimensions going here, but it would appear that the, the driveway is probably um, tight to that. So we have to take a look at that. Okay. Thank David, what, what, uh, what session are you citing right now? Um, on 11-11 11 11 of Article 11, uh, Paragraph 10.113.42. And talks in residential zoning districts, uh, off street parking spaces, mm -hmm. in particular is talking to home occupation use, but again, we don't have a, um, an art studio use that's defined in our ordinance. So I was just trying to see if there was any consideration of that. That's all I have. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Any other questions from the board? Uh, thank you. I'll open the public hearing now. Is there anyone here would like to speak to, for, or against this application? Please step forward and state your name and address for the record. Hi, oh, excuse me. My name is Sarah Lynch. I live across the street. Um, the map was just up at 19 Sunset Road. Um, I'm also an artist, an art teacher. I teach at Sacred Heart in Hampton. I taught at Portsmouth Middle School last year. And when Karen first moved to the neighborhood, she had me tour the space and kind of got my feedback on class sizes and appropriate projects and um, for different age levels and so I can um, 
confirm that it's a very small. Excuse me, could you please just move closer to the, the Sorry. larger microphone? Sorry. Thanks. Oh, there we go. Oh, yes. wow. Did you hear any of that? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm also getting over laryngitis, but a long time ago last week. But um, <coughs> did you hear that first part? I did. I don't know if the record did, but I did. So. Do you want me to repeat it? Yeah, or? Perhaps, if you could. Okay, so my name is Sarah Lynch. I live across the street, 19 Sunset Road. I'm the art teacher at Sacred Heart in Hampton. I taught at Portsmouth Middle School last year as a long-term art substitute. And when Karen first moved in, um, she had me come see her space, and we went over um, what she was thinking of offering class sizes, projects, what's appropriate for different age levels. And I can just attest that it's a small space, very modest. Um, she wouldn't be able to have anything big or disruptive in the space. So I think it's very modest and in keeping with the neighborhood. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Please come up, state your name and address for the record. Oh, I think you're going to have a fight. <laughs> Hi there. I'm Linda Leland from 26 Thaxter Road. Um, and when Rick and Karen moved in and renovated their home, I really believe that they've already really greatly increased our neighborhood in so many ways. And then I got to meet them and go in and tour this lovely studio and I was so excited at the prospect, um, not just personally, but for our whole neighborhood. Um, one of the greatest things I think we can all agree to about the West End is the Button Factory art studio. And to have a place in the community where we can go actually and create art from a professional, somebody who's passionate and as talented as she is, it's just very exciting, and it's a small, intimate setting. Um, we'll get to come together as a community. We'll get to create art. And a lot of her creations are made, I think she said, from things that are repurposed. So it's also just really great for the planet. Um, and I just see only great, you know, great things. I don't think it's going to be um, a nuisance in any way. Just going to add value to all of us. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. I'm a little shy. My name is Sachiko Akiyama. I live at 161 Aldrich, um, and I'm, so I'm her neighbor, and I'm also an art professor at UNH. Um, I just want to set, echo what Linda just said. I think what they did to their house already increased the value of our neighborhood, and Karen and Rick are so responsible and responsive, and I have no worries about there's so much parking on the street. And um, the other thing I wanted to say I know that Portsmouth has so many art venues and like there's the button factory, but I think it's really difficult for artists to actually live in Portsmouth and to run a business. Like that's why I teach at UNH. Like I can't afford to live in Portsmouth if I tried to um, rent a studio. Like even the button factory is really expensive now to rent a space. So I do think it's really cost prohibitive to run a business as an artist in Portsmouth. And, and she's been so responsible the way she set everything up. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sandra Traverse, and I'm here in my role as a board member for Arts and Reach. We are a youth development organization empowering underserved girls and gender expansive teens through free access to arts programming, to mentorship, and to creative community. We just celebrated our 25th year. I don't know how many of you are familiar with us. We do have a presence in Portsmouth. Um, for, those who, who of, for those of you who are not, we don't have any physical art space, so we rely on the generosity of artists like Karen, <coughs> excuse me, who donate their time and their space. Right now we are experiencing alarming rates of depression and anxiety in teens and air, specifically using art as a vehicle for mentorship, for very needed mental health services, and life-changing opportunities needs educators like Karen to help assist us in this crisis. Karen is that caring mentor, and her incredibly warm and inviting space um, offers teens a safe place, a familiar setting, and most importantly, it offers con consistency. These teens don't have that, and it's what they most need. She recently conducted a very successful workshop for AIR and our teens, and moving forward, they will have the option to try other mediums under her inst instruction. We are very, very grateful for, for Karen. In summary, granting Karen's request to hold small workshops in her studio would amplify access to creative media and to their much needed benefits for this community. I respectfully request that the board approve Karen's application. 
Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sharon Hartford. I live at 59 Boss Avenue. And I want to say that all of this sounds really wonderful. Um, I do have some concerns, however, as a pretty much a direct neighbor on the street. Uh, I'm wondering about the parking. That end of Boss tends to be particularly congested with people who live there that park on the street. And getting through there can be very tight. I'm also concerned, since this is not um, zoned as a business district, that it sets a precedent going forward for anyone else who wants to have a business in their house now. If this is approved, how are you then going to deny anyone else who wants to have a business in their home in a neighborhood that's district as residential? It all sounds fantastic. I think she definitely adds a benefit to the community. I have nothing at all against arts. Um, nothing at all against providing a platform for youth and teens to experience art. I'm just questioning whether this is the right venue to hold this type of a thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anyone else who would wish to speak? No need to apologize. Hi. Um, met me earlier. Uh, Christine Powell, uh, I live on Kensington. Um, sorry, I just want to make sure that I remember what I wanted to say because I get nervous when I speak. Um, so obviously I'm speaking on behalf of my friend Karen who is petitioning for the ability to hold classes in her house uh, on the side of her home. Um, personally, I've been a resident of Portsmouth um, for 43 years. Um, 10 years removed, I lived in Rye for 10 years. You can't hold that against me. Um, I live on Kensington with my husband, um, and I'm a professional over at uh, Liberty Mutual. And um, anyway, that's just a reference who I am. Um, this past spring, I had the pleasure of meeting Karen and Rick. I learned that Karen was a wonderful artist um, and a talented director, uh, de decorator. She showed me her studio, which was a beautiful, welcoming, peaceful space. I mean, it was it was gorgeous. Um, and her touches were amazing, and she does um, refurbish things, which I think is amazing, um, again, for the um, environment. Personally, when I was in there, from a size and safety perspective, I felt that her studio was plenty big enough to support um, the art classes that she's proposing. Um, it also had um, an easily accessible exit. It was like, literally, if you turn around, you're out the door. So. Um, there was no fear of being able to get out, et cetera, um, if there was a problem. Um, their driveway is fairly big and deep, um, and their people park on that road all the time, and it is very wide at the bottom. Um, I walk my dog by there every day, not that that matters. Um, let me see here. I hope you do grant this uh, request because I have plenty of friends that would love to attend her classes. Um, and um, on a personal note, um, my grandmother was an artist over um, on the Cape, Cape Cod, and she had classes, and it really um, helped uh, the community there, the older community. Um, oh, and I wanted to make a comment about um, your comments, or David, I think is your name. Um, what makes her place unique is, as you pointed out, she actually has proactively gone and put in a fire extinguisher and made sure that she had a bathroom for people who come there and make sure that the exit is easily accessible and she's putting in a walkway and she has a fire extinguisher. So that is what makes her place unique from the other neighbors around the place. And Karen is actually being conscientious in going to you guys and asking for support and um, petitioning the right way. And I got to tell you, there are some other people in the community that do have businesses in their home that have not done such. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Eric Weinrub, uh, nine, <clears throat> nine Middle Road. Um, 
I didn't come here with the intent of speaking on this on, but listening to it, and I really wanted to come and support it, but as I'm hearing it, I am struggling. I obviously live in the neighborhood. I walk my dog in the neighborhood. I drive through the neighborhood daily, and they've done a fantastic job with their renovation of the house. I had it on the second floor. It, it was, it's amazing what they've done from the outside. I haven't been inside, but I'm struggling with the location and the use. Sunset that it drops out into is one of the steepest streets in the city. And it's an incredibly dangerous intersection. There's a lot of kids in the area. And as they start to park more and more on, uh, on Boss, I think that, and increase the traffic there, that I think it's gonna create a safety issue. And I think that I wanna support it, but I'm really struggling with the vehicular safety, the parking. Um, so I just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to, for, or against? Okay. And Stephanie, is there anyone on Zoom? No. Okay. Uh, seeing no one rise, I will close the public hearing. Uh, board, any thoughts, deliberations? Well, I feel a little bit like the Grinch who stole Christmas, oh, no. but uh, I am having a hard time seeing hardship. Uh, criteria satisfied in this case is the only issue here the fact that it would be a commercial enterprise in other words if the applicant just decided that because of her sincere love of the arts she wanted to have people over to her house to engage in the arts uh, there would not be any permit required right I mean that's that's up to her to have people in and do whatever artists do is that not correct Right, I mean, and not paying for classes yeah. or? Sure, I mean, anybody could leave a donation to a person they like in a jar, but they don't have to be charged for what they're doing. I'm just speculating out loud. So in other words, this person could fulfill her dreams of engaging with the local art community if it's not a commercial enterprise. And that would be permitted in this area. That's what I'm asking you. I mean, I would say that's probably true. I mean, anyone could have friends over and you could make art, you know, that's... You could even have enemies over, <laughs> Peter, and make them into friends later. Right. So, yeah, sure. okay, just, I just wanted to uh, clarify that. Thank you. I also actually wanted to clarify one other point, and it's something that we've encountered in the past when we've had to make difficult decisions uh, that were, you know, seemingly not very friendly, but... The, if permitted, this stays with the property. So the next person who wants to come in and form a commercial enterprise there has the permission to engage in a commercial activity in this residential building in the future, even though it may not be art or it may not be the well, same kind of art. It could be. It would have to be. What is approved? To, if you approve, if you approve this request, there's, there's a lot of art. Have you ever been to like well, a big? mechanical sculpture grounds. I mean, people do welding and hammering and, you know, all kinds of stuff. But if it were an accountant, it would need it to come back right. again. Right, if it was some That's other type of saying. business. Right. Mm. But if they did it for free. But it stays with the property. It's not just this right. person's yes, dream. When this person yes. satisfies no, their dream and right. decides to wrap it up, that permit is still there. It lives with the property. Yes, that is correct. Mr. Masson, did you have anything? Um, yeah, I, I guess I would just add that uh, I am struggling a little bit with finding the unnecessary hardship for the property itself. Um, and regarding the uh, spirit of the ordinance, I know this is a single family residence uh, zoning, um, but there are also other parts of the ordinance that promote the arts and, and whatnot. So the uh, aspects of the ordinance, it, it could still be in the spirit of the ordinance, um, but there's still the issue of the unnecessary hardship for the that specific property. Thank you. Any concerns from the peanut gallery over here? I think I'll start with Mr. No, Mills. go ahead, Dave. <laughs> you had, he had his hand up longer than me. <laughs> you go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so my impression of this case is, is that we have a, a very wonderful person who's probably doing a very wonderful thing. Um, our concern for this board is, is this wonderful thing being done in the right place? 
And that comes back down to our zoning ordinance, which is, you know, put together, um, suggested by the planning board, approved by our city council based off of lots of public input. And one of the fundamental tenets of our zoning ordinance is that we do distinguish between residential areas and business areas. There's good reasons for it. Um, and when you buy into a residential area, your expectation is, is that your neighbors are going to be doing uh, things that are associated with a residential use and that you're not going to be seeing, as the applicant has added, asked for here, uh, a pretty steady time frame where they're going to be expecting um, what are essentially customers coming in to um, perform something and uh, in, in that space uh, that is, is for the intent of uh, furthering on maybe both themselves but also for the, for the owner of the place. <clears throat> that is what, uh, that's what the applicant is asking for here. So, so with that, we are, are we're, we're basically trying to create something here where perhaps our ordinance should recognize Art Studio as a uh, as a city that prides itself on on being um, receptive to artists. Um, I, I would tend to agree that um, that's something that maybe we should figure out where an, what an Art Studio is and where it should go. But at this point in time, we don't have anything like that in our ordinance, and. We seem as a board to be being asked to kind of create a whole new area of our zoning ordinance where we're going to create this new use called an art studio. We're going to decide that it can be uh, allowed in residential districts. Uh, we're going to create parking uh, requirements for it where we're kind of like trying to decide, well, four spaces, is that enough? The applicant has already come before us and basically said, yeah, I'm pretty much expecting people are going to have to park in the street. Well, okay, maybe there is adequate parking there, but at the same point in time, if you're in that neighborhood, your expectation is that when you are, are coming home or when you do have friends over for whatever it is that you want to go and do, that there would be that ample parking because, again, it's a residential neighborhood and you're not having to share that with, um, with any business uses. So uh, that, that's my concern here, going back specifically to our criteria. Again, spirit of the ordinance, it's tough to say when we don't have this defined in our ordinance, when we don't really have it worked out in terms of parking, um, when, when again, the applicant's um, application here really doesn't define what off-street parking will really be provided. We do have very strict requirements, especially for businesses, on, on the orientation, on the size of parking spaces. Um, all that's done for very good reasons, because people that are visiting that, that space, unlike the residents who live there all the time and know how to finagle their way into that little corner in the, in the parking lot, you're now expecting people who are unfamiliar with it to have, be able to come in, effectively use the parking, not collide with other vehicles on the way out, et cetera. Those are all the things that are built into our ordinance to, to help protect both, both property owners and the, and the people that are coming to uh, use their property for a business purpose. So all of those things I just think, uh, you know, from the spirit of the ordinance uh, that we, we are not meeting, and then a hardship, really hardship, what has been brought before here. I know one of the neighbors, and, and again, I, I appreciate everybody's support of your, of your neighbor. Again, a wonderful person doing a wonderful thing but um, that's not a hardship. Saying that I'm going to build something on my property that, so I can create a hardship so that you have to grant me the ability to go and use the thing that I just built is a logic that we can't follow. Anyone can go and do that, right? I'll, I'll go and build a sawmill on my property and say, hey, look, I got a sawmill. That's my hardship. Um, grant me the ability to go use my sawmill. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Um, so with, with all those things considered, I, I can't support the idea that we could go and say that this meets the criteria that are before us to allow uh, this to take place in a residential area. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mal, do you have anything to add? No. Okay. So I think I'm going to call the question. <laughs> um, would anyone like to uh, make a motion on this application? Uh, I'll make a motion to deny. Okay. And do I hear a second? You could raise your hand higher than that. I'll see. Okay. <laughs> Second by Phyllis. Okay. With <laughs> the incoming chair, you have to be a little more assertive. <laughs> it is so, very green. Uh, the reasons for your denial, Mr. Rayum? Yeah. So as I just went through in, in some detail, we have five criteria that we need to have satisfied. If you fail on any one of them, um, then your ap application cannot be granted. In my opinion, this fails on, on the two of them, as I indicated. 
One is granted the var uh, variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance. So the facts there, again, our art studio is not recognized by our ordinance in any way, shape, or manner. It's not like it's, it's not allowed in this zone. It's just simply not recognized, period. Even if it were recognized, I find it very difficult to believe it would be in this zone. Again, residential uses, if you go through our table, there is essentially no business uses that are allowed in this district or even in the most adjacent one of the general residence uh, C. Um, and then uh, in terms of uh, unnecessary hardship, I just don't see anything in particular with this property that would say that it has any anything that's unique about it relative to anyone else's property that it would be in, in the same or similar district uh, that would say that it is uniquely qualified to go and, and have a business use placed on it where all those other neighbors shouldn't get it because they don't have that very, very unique thing. The applicant hasn't hasn't demonstrated that. I can't find it um, in, in the property, so I, I think it falls down on uh, both of those. Uh, I'm presuming we don't have to find statement of facts for the other areas that we, we no, don't. I think, okay. No, for denial. So with that, uh, for denial, um, that's my recommendation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Eldridge, do you have anything to add? I agree with everything that Mr. Ruham said, but it's also from the very first time I joined this board, I knew there would be things that common sense says, yeah, this is a good thing. This makes sense and it would be good. But it just doesn't meet the criteria, and so I have to support the motion to deny. Okay. And if, if I may, I'm sure. Just one more thing about it. I mean, we do, ha again, have that legislative process of, of creating our ordinance. Our ordinance should be fluid, but it has to go through that legislative process of the planning board looking at it, looking thoroughly, balancing the needs of all of the uh, butters, balancing the needs of all of the neighborhoods, and making sure that it all makes sense, and then making those recommendations to the city council, who, again, they are looking at it from a legislative aspect of, yes, we want to promote the arts. Yes, this is something that is a good compromise for our community. Yes. As neighbors, we should all be willing to live with these kinds of, of things. But that, to me, is beyond the purview of this board, just reviewing this in this one night for this short period of time. That's a much more lengthy process. Yes, absolutely. Mr. Mantle? Um, I just want to add my two cents. I have no problem with the application. I think it's wonderful. Uh, the parking, I just judging from the pictures, I believe you can get at least eight cars, if not more, in your driveway. So that's, for me, it's not an issue. But as Mr. Matson brought up early, I can't square the hardship. I don't see the hardship. Uh, and for that reason, I'll be supporting the motion. Okay. So thank you. The motion is to deny as presented and advertised. And I will start with Mr. Mantel. Yes. Mr. Rayum. Yes. Ms. Eldridge. Yes. Mr. Rossi. Yes. yes. Mr. Matson. Yes. And the chair votes yes. Acting chair votes yes. I'm sorry. The application is denied. Okay. So the next application is 96 Chestnut Street. Um, the application is, I'm sorry, just I need for people to move out of the chambers. Just if you want to speak, please go out in the, the room. So, the request of Rudy Story Lazy Holding, LLC owner, for property located at 96 Chestnut Street, whereas relief is needed for conversion of an existing office into residential, which requires the following. One, a variance from section 10.5A41, figure 10.5A41.10A, to allow A, a lot area per dwelling of 2,046 feet, where 3,000 square feet is required, and B, 14% open space, where 25% minimum, 25 minimum open space is required. Two, a variance from section 10.321 to allow a non-conforming building or structure to be extended, reconstructed, or enlarged without conforming to the requirements of the ordinance. Said property is located on assessor map 116, lot 24, and lies within the character district 4L1, um, 4L1 and historic districts. And who is here to speak to this application? Uh, good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm Chris Mulligan from Bozen and Associates here in Portsmouth on behalf of the applicant, Rudy Storlazzi Holding, LLC. Um, with me is Tina Bozen, uh, one of the principals of Rudy Storlazzi, LLC. Um, 
Attorney John Bozen could not be here tonight. Uh, he's handling another matter, so I drew the uh, straw today. Um, <laughs> 96 Chestnut Street, uh, interesting property. This uh, it was actually the former home of my law firm for a number of years. Um, and uh, has subsequently uh, been the home uh, to Darcy Creative, which vacated the property a couple of months ago, um, an advertising and uh, digital arts firm. Um, the uh, re uh, relief we need uh, this evening um, is to convert the property um, back into a single family residence. Um, because of the zone we're in, we're in the CD4L1 uh, district, um, we do not have um, the required lot area per dwelling. Um, <coughs> and um, because in order to um, facilitate the conversion of this property back into a single family residence, we would like to install a very small deck um, off the rear of the property to access the existing um, uh, stone patio, um, the amount of lot <laughs> coverage, um, or the amount of open space coverage uh, increases. It's already non-compliant, um, and I just handed uh, out some photographs, um, but th the purpose of the photographs is to demonstrate a couple of things. Um, this property is on uh, Chestnut Street, um, where the African Burying Ground uh, Memorial is. So it's between State Street and Court Street. The first picture shows the Court Street um, side of the building. And you'll notice that the brick parking uh, <coughs> driveway um, takes up the entirety of the area between the uh, building itself and the neighboring building, which has frontage on Court Street. The other side of the building is essentially on the lot line. So um, beyond the building to the rear is this um, stone patio, um, which you can see some pictures of. Um, on the second page, um, the first and second picture show the area where we um, <clears throat> would like to install a deck that would come off of that bump out on the building and allow us to access the, um, directly access the um, stone patio. That is approximately 60 square feet of decking. That's the open space that the city would be sacrificing if you approve this. Um, you can see it's, it's currently housing two HVAC condenser systems and uh, you know it's being used for storage for uh, recycling bins. Um, so uh, the loss of open space in this particular instance to me is really a case of losing the sleeves off your vest. Um, that is not usable open space by any common sense definition. There's never going to be any landscaping um, or you know lawn attractive plantings, gardens, anything like that. Um, the fact that there's uh, open space at all to me is a little mystifying because the rear of the property, the backyard, is almost entirely taken over by this stone patio, but apparently that is considered open space, um, not uh, impervious surface. But be that as it may, the property is in the CD4L1 zone. Directly next door to it, um, the neighboring property towards the State Street side is in the CD4 zone where there is no um, minimum lot area per dwelling requirement at all. So if we were just one property over, we wouldn't need that relief, but the lines are where they are and uh, that's why we're here. Um, so th again, the goal is to convert the property to single family residence. This is a structure that was built in the 1840s or 1850s as a single family residence long before there was any zoning at all. Um, and it's since been converted um, over the years to office use. Um, what's significant and that what has changed in the last several years is that the African burying ground has now taken over this portion of Chestnut Street. Um, that has resulted in the loss of seven 
parking spaces on Chestnut Street. And it also has created a bit of a pinch point um, on Chestnut Street for people who would be visiting um, the establishment if this were to remain a commercial uh, uh, building. The, um, the problem with the uh, commercial use of this property, number one, I think, which was alluded to in our materials, um, commercial office space is just not in very high demand right now as a result of the pandemic. Um, but with the, um, the placement of the African burial ground, it's very difficult for people who are not familiar with the area to be entering into and getting out of uh, Chestnut Street in this um, you know, in the way it's currently configured. And I'll just give you an anecdote. I live in this neighborhood on State Street right around the block, and during one of the recent holiday parades, I think it might have been the Halloween parade, um, I saw some people from out of town, obviously. You can you see those Massachusetts license plates. Um, try, to, try to beat traffic and get away from the parade crowd, go down Chestnut Street and have no idea what to do once they got to the end of <laughs> the African burying ground. Um, so good neighbor that I am, I coached them on how to get out and go through the TD Bank parking lot um, to relative safety. But um, I think it's symptomatic of why this particular <clears throat> property is no longer really appropriate for um, a commercial use and why a residential use where you would have um, permanent residents who know the area very well um, would uh, would find the uh, the placement and positioning of the monumentation there not to be that big a deal because they would understand and be very familiar with them. So that is the uh, project in a nutshell, um, just to address the criteria necessary for granting the variance. Um, granting the variances will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the ordinance, nor will they be contrary to the public interest. These are considered together under relevant case law. Um, here the uh, test is whether or not the essential character of the neighborhood would be altered by granting the requested variances. This is a very mixed neighborhood. You've got uh, residential apartment buildings on the corner on State Street. You've got a single family residence next door on the corner of um, uh, Court Street. You've got public housing across Court Street. You've got a mixed um, commercial um, and uh, residential uh, building right across the street. You've got Eric Weinrib's um, office building. <clears throat> On the other corner, um, so it, it's a very mixed neighborhood. Adding a single family residence um, to the neighborhood does not change the essential character of the neighborhood. Health, safety, and welfare of the public, I think, is going to be improved by the variances that would uh, facilitate transitioning this property into a single family residence for the reasons I just discussed. Um, you won't have um, the traffic conflict with the African burying ground um, when you have permanent residents living in the space. Um, so health, safety, and welfare, um, I, I believe, will be augmented by uh, the, um, the, the uh, change that these variances will facilitate. Um, I will also point out that this project, uh, at least the deck um, that we're proposing, requires historic district approval. So. Um, the welfare of the public will be, at least aesthetic welfare of the public, will be adequately looked out for. Um, granting the variance um, uh, would result in substantial justice. Here the loss to the applicant far outweighs any gain to the general public if you were to require strict compliance with the ordinance. Um, we can't possibly meet the lot area per dwelling requirement. The lot is just not big enough. It's a pre-existing non-conforming lot for this particular use, um, but there's no way to comply. We can't make the lot any bigger. Um, so that to me is, is kind of a hardship per se. Um, and uh, it's not as though the neighboring properties are significantly bigger um, than the one we have here. Um, as far as the open space 
um, variance that we're requesting, it's a minimal deck that we're talking about, approximately 60 square feet, and it's covering open space that's open space in name only. Um, there's really nothing about it that that you would normally consider to be open space. So substantial justice would be done by granting the uh, requested variances. Um, the proposed use um, and the variances would not diminish surrounding property values. Single family residences are permitted by right in the CD4 L1 zone. Um, again, I believe that the, uh, the gain to the public and the gain to the surrounding properties as a result of converting this to single family residence and taking some of the potential traffic burden off of the African burying ground monumentation um, will improve um, the values of surrounding properties. You'll have less uh, aimlessly misdirected traffic going into um, uh, this part of Chestnut Street. Um, then as far as unnecessary hardship, I think there are a couple of items about this property that are unique. First, the lot size is uh, smaller than is required for this particular zone. It's a small lot as it is. Um, it's essentially fully developed, um, basically lot line to lot line with either structures, parking, uh, you know, impervious parking, or this, you know, fairly impervious um, uh, patio uh, configuration to the rear of the property. Um, so those are unique characteristics of the property that I think um, separate it from uh, the others in the neighborhood. I think the fact that the African burying ground, um, since this property was converted to office use, the African burial, burying ground has been, um, uh, has been instituted on Chestnut Street, removing all of the off-street parking on Chestnut Street. Again, that is a, uh, a unique factor um, th that impacts this property. So there is no fair and substantial relationship between the purposes of the lot area per dwelling and the open space requirements in their application to this particular project. Um, it's a reasonable use. It's a residential use that's permitted in this zone. It's got residential uses on both sides and across the street. Um, and I believe it meets all the criteria um, and you should grant the variances. Thank you, Attorney Mulligan. Are there any questions from the board? Mr. Ram? Um, just, just a statement. I, I think I remember that Kevin Guy used to have his insurance office in, the built, in this building as well a long time ago. That's, I feel like I went there. Yes. <laughs> I that would be before Mead and Loring then. Yeah. Uh, but God that's rest, a long time ago. God, God rest his soul. Um, okay. So um, I am concerned, however, about, um, I, I guess I would have appreciated more information in the original packet on this, this planned deck, because it did cause me some confusion, and I scribbled some notes on here regarding it. Uh, now, you, you said it's 60 square feet, but um, we're actually showing a change from 19% down to 14% open space, which by my calculation is roughly 100 square feet. Do you know... Um, is the intent to like bridge the gap between this opening and and this sort of this, this wall here and have steps yes. on the opposite side? Yes. So um, the pictures that I just handed up, David, you can see there's this curved mm -hmm. bump out. Yeah. It would there would be like a sliding door installed there, and it would basically be a deck over the HVAC condensers to the um, to the, the uh, patio. patio. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, because you're showing about eight, 8 feet 5 inches by 7 feet, which, you know, that is roughly 60 square feet. But if you're going a little bit further, plus your steps, you might actually need the full 100 square feet that we're granting you. So, okay. Any other questions or concerns? I was told there'd be no math on this quiz, Dave. <laughs> I, I was going to ask some engineering questions as well. <laughs> you would have been yeah. sorely you disappointed. Think, Mr. You're an engineer, aren't you, David? <laughs> yeah. I, I would just add a comment as well that uh, for po possible consideration, if this were approved, uh, I'm not exactly sure that you can have condensers under a deck without the appropriate clearance, uh, just for airflow and everything. So it's yep. a 
something to consider. That, that was the engineering question. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm you, an you, have to, you have to, you have to double check that. Yeah. Anything else from the board? Okay. Thank you, Attorney Thank you. Is there anyone here to speak to, for, or against the application? back on uh, <clears throat> Eric Weinrib, Nine Middle Road, but my office is right across the street, 133 Court. Um, when I bought my office building 20 some odd years ago, that was actually the MRO district and I actually lived in half and uh, got it converted to office for the other half. And <clears throat> I've seen a lot of change in the area. I uh, witnessed the change with the African burial ground. And one of the things, and transformation from Mead and Loring, but I don't remember uh, Guy being there. That, that was before me. <laughs> um, one of the things I have seen in downtown is that we've lost a lot of vibrancy because we've lost ground floor residential living. Um, we have a couple apartments above, um, behind my building, uh, across the street from this one. I think that converting this to residential will add vibrancy um, to the African burial ground area. I also think that, as um, <clears throat> stated, that it's an interesting area to access. I mean, I park in there. I feel all these years later, I still feel we are driving through there. But I come in, I have a routine. I pull in actually into their driveway primarily and then back into my driveway um, and park there. And for people not familiar with the area, it, it's an awkward movement. So if you were to create a situation where it's going to be a residence, it's going to be the same people going in and out of there. I think it's going to improve safety. We have a lot of pedestrians there. Um, it'll re remove that transient, um, that feel. <clears throat> I, I think it's a great solution to uh, convert it to residential. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak? Do we have anyone on Zoom, Stephanie? I don't see anyone. Yeah. Well, seeing no one rise, I'll no one. Okay, I'll close the public hearing. Um, board, is there anyone who would like to make a motion? Um, Madam Chair, I'd move to uh, approve as presented and advertised. Thank you. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Matson. Your motion, Mr. Ram. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the applicants made a. A good case here that um, that a situation that was really kind of out of anyone's control, and uh, certainly, particularly as the property owner, um, no one would, could have expected that uh, there would be an African burying ground um, in the in the street in front of your uh, property. Um, that did change the dynamic, I think, of of this, and and does contribute to uh, some of the criteria um, that's here. Um, what the applicant is asking for is a permitted use uh, in the CD four L one. Um, it's simply that their uh, lot size is uh, not quite adequate. And then the uh, request for the additional lack of op open space, so they're already non-conforming, uh, and changing that somewhat to allow a, um, from, for residential use to allow a way to go directly from your house out to a patio area without having to go down a, a, a relatively narrow and crowded driveway um, also makes some, some sense as well. So with that uh, relevant facts here, uh, granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest. Uh, so the, the, certainly the, the, the public, I think there is actually a, a positive public interest here in that um, with, the, with the burying ground being there now, having a business in this area is going to invite that much more traffic. Um, people trying to come in uh, to use the use the business, perhaps unsure, you know, using their um, their app on their phone to go and try and find it, and thinking that there's going to be parking right up front, only to find out that there isn't. Uh, I, I do think that there's actually an, an interest on the on the public's uh, part to have this being converted into a, a residence, both contributing positively to our our need for additional residence um, type structures, but also to eliminate uh, some of the confusion that could be associated with this, you know, significant change to uh, Chestnut Street. Uh, granting the, the variance would be observe the spirit of the ordinance. Again, uh, we do actually have, it's an allowed use. 
Uh, it's an existing structure. It's an existing lot that's been there for a long, long time. Uh, to say that an existing structure on an existing lot that is non-conforming can't have a revised use that is a permitted use uh, would, would seem to be against what the ordinance is really trying to accomplish here. And then in terms of uh, open space, already non-conforming, making it somewhat more so, but um, at, at the same point in time, within, within allowable uh, limits, um, it is to the rear of the property. The, the loss of open space is not anything that the public is going to be uh, uh, perceiving. Um, and with that, for, for facts, for the um, substantial justice, again, the property owner's ability to convert this into a residential uh, use, um, adding in a, a, a way to get over to an already existing open patio area makes more sense uh, as part of that conversion to a residential use. There's really no public um, need here that would prevent us from allowing the, um, the current property owner to take full advantage of that. Uh, granting the variance would not diminish the value of surrounding properties. Um, again, these are relatively minor changes. It is um, from, it looks like a residential um, building. It's fact that it was ac actually an office use was probably more awkward and more of a negative consequence for uh, neighboring properties. I think this will bring it uh, more into overall conformance and, and uh, certainly um, it probably help property values, but certainly not negatively impact them. And then uh, the, the hardship. So this property does have special conditions against an existing lot. It has had a structure on it for um, many, 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 many years. Um, that, that structure looks like, like a house, was probably a residence when it was originally built, almost certainly was. Was converted at one point in time to uh, an office use, but converting it back um, is um, certainly within the realm of plausibilities. Um, unique, so this unique lot here um, is, is the way it was, um, even though the ordinance now would require a little bit more. If you look at the other properties in the neighborhood, they probably are, are closer to conforming, whereas this one does not. And then, uh, again, the minimal loss of open space um, is, is not a significant uh, loss here. And then, uh, lastly, it is a, a reasonable request to um, go in and uh, request that additional loss of open space um, to make this a full residence use. Uh, so with that, I would recommend um, approval. Anything, any, want to add anything to your second, Mr. Madsen? Uh, no, that's good. good <laughs> <laughs> I'm reviewing the tape. <laughs> <coughs> any other comments before we take a vote? Okay. So the motion is to approve as presented and advertise it. And uh, Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Rossi? Yes. Ms. Eldridge? Yes. Mr. Rayum? Yes. Mr. Mantle? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Your application is approved. It's very odd to speak of myself in the third person. Um, <laughs> so we usually take a break at 9 o'clock. Um, I think we have a, a, I just want to see what the board is thinking. Uh, 39 Homes Court is the next application. It's somewhat straightforward. I don't know if the board would like to hear that application, There's take a break, them, and then go to 43 Homes Court. So let's uh, see what the board wants to do. I can go now. Um, yeah, my thought is those two applications are kind of linked in some ways. I don't know if we want to try and deal with them um, consecutively together, but together. that's just my thought. <laughs> um, okay, well, why don't we take a break now and then uh, we'll come back and we'll hear. Uh, we'll start off with 39 home support. Thank you.
Well, then it wouldn't be a business. Okay, mm -hmm. Welcome back to the uh, December 20th Zoning Board of Adjustment yeah, meeting. Uh, we The next application for consideration is uh, the request of Stephen A. and Catherine L. Singlar owners for property located at 39 Homes Court, whereas relief is needed for addition of, of a shed dormer, heat pump, and new paved area, which requires the following. One, variances from section 10.521 to allow a A, two feet rear yard where 25 feet is required, and B, 22 open 22 percent open space where 25 percent is the minimum required. A variance, for, number two, a variance from section 10.515.14 to allow a zero foot setback where 10 feet is required for a heat pump. Number three, a variance from section 10.321 to allow a non-conforming building or structure to be extended, reconstructed, or enlarged without conforming to the requirements of the ordinance. Said property is located on Assessor Map 101, Lot 13, and lies within General Residence B and the Historic District. And who is here to speak to this application? Madam Acting Chair, members of the Board, uh, Attorney Derek Durbin, I'm here on behalf of the uh, owners of the property, Stephen Singlar and Catherine Singlar. Um, who are also the applicants. Um, I also have with me Eric Weinrup from Altus Engineering, who's seated behind me. Um, Stephen Singlar is um, here in attendance. Um, I believe Brendan McNamara should be on um, virtually as well from Australia um, to answer any uh, questions you might have about the um, design that's proposed. Um, so the property we're talking about um, is a unique property um, in the respect that the um, public portion of the right-of-way um, that you see as Holmes Court um, actually ends at the front boundary of the property. Um, after that, it turns into a private drive that runs um, directly through the center of the property to 43 Holmes Court, um, which is also owned um, by the Singlars as well. Uh, the property does contain a non-conforming uh, single-family home that was constructed in the uh, early 1900s. Um, aside from the asbestos um, siding that's on the home, um, it essentially remains in its uh, original form. Uh, the home is in need of a full-scale renovation. Um, as a result of the bifurcation of the property um, by Homes Court or the private drive that runs um, through the middle of it, um, the building envelope for this property is um, very small, as you'll see from the plans. Um, the home really can't be expanded without obtaining um, variance relief from the ordinance. Um, it encroaches into the side and rear yard setbacks in its existing condition. Um, so the uh, proposal um, before the board um, necessitating the relief is um, for a dormer um, to, the, uh, to the top level of the home um, to create more headroom, um, more livable space uh, for, the, for the existing home. Also for a heat pump to the rear that you'll see on the um, site plan um, that would be located in close proximity to the um, rear property boundary uh, shared with 43 Homes Court. Um, this would be obviously to provide central um, heat and air. Um, the shed dormer that would be um, added to the east facing or the rear section of the home um, would maintain the existing um, 2.1 foot um, rear yard setback. Um, actually, because it's recessed, it'll be technically speaking, set back in a little bit um, further from that. Um, so it will not encroach any further into that um, non-conforming setback than, than what exists with the house. Uh, the heat pump um, is also proposed in the rear yard of the property. Um, so with that particular issue, um, you know, the, there is really no other um, logical location um, for the heat pump that would work on the property. Um, it is in close proximity, but still a considerable distance away from the, the um, house at 43 um, Holmes Court. Um, unless there are any questions at this stage, I'd simply turn to the variance criteria, because I know you still have um, some other items on the agenda, as well as our other application before you. So, happy to answer. proceed. Okay. Granting the variance would not be contrary to the spirit of the, um, and intent of the zoning ordinance or the public interest. Uh, I would submit to the board that the minimum building setback requirements uh, are enacted for the purpose of creating and preserving separation between um, buildings on abutting properties, maintain light, air, and space, also to protect against the spread of fire in certain instances. Uh, the proposed shed dormer will be uh, situated a considerable distance away from the home 
at 43 Holmes Court. Uh, so none of those light air space concerns are presented by that uh, or any privacy concerns. Same can be said of the heat pump, um, as I pointed out as well. Um, it is defined as a structure under the zoning ordinance by definition. Um, it's really not a structure and function, though, if you think about it. It's not like a deck or something that really um, would potentially be imposing upon a neighboring property. Um, it is designed to run very quietly. Uh, the figures that I got, I didn't have a spec sheet to present to the board tonight, but the figures that I got um, from the spec sheet is 54 decibels um, when it's cooling, um, 58 decimals in its heating mode. So it is designed to run very efficiently, quietly. Uh, the heat pump will be adjacent to the left side yard of the property at 43 Holmes Court, um, which if you were, um, if you did go out to the property, you were looking from that back at 43 Holmes Court in the water, it's basically just open space all the way to the water from the heat pump. Um, the house at 43 Holmes Court is um, situated slightly, it's inset from that. Uh, if granted, the uh, variance does not alter the essential character, the locale, um, the architecture, um, and size of the home will remain consistent with the others on Holmes Court and those surrounding it on abutting streets. Um, heat pumps are not uncommon, as this board is aware, um, throughout the south end of Portsmouth. Um, it will be unnoticeable to um, other properties, um, except for 43 Holmes Court, uh, which the applicants also own. Uh, I would submit to the board the renovation of the home is in the public's interest. Um, the uh, the home, the, those parts of the home that are um, renovated, which will consist of most of it, will be brought up to current code. Um, so that is a, uh, a benefit to the public in this case. Substantial justice will be done in granting the variance. Uh, the dormer will allow um, for the headroom uh, needed to really make that a, a functional um, top floor attic space, uh, living space, I should say. Um, and the, the heat pump will allow for the provision of central uh, heat and air. Uh, none of these uh, improvements will impact abutting properties. Um, therefore, there is uh, really no loss to the public that would outweigh the loss to the applicant in this instance if the variance relief were denied. Surrounding property values will not be diminished by granting the variances. Um, the uh, improvements proposed for the home are designed to be in keeping with uh, those in the, in the neighborhood and consistent therewith. Um, if the variances are approved tonight, um, this will still need a, a approval from the HDC. Um, it has already gone through that preliminary process, a work session um, did, was met with um, favorable reviews, um, which is the reason why that design is before the board tonight. Um, so that um, process does add an additional layer of protection um, for the public and the protection of surrounding property values. Uh, denying the variances would constitute an unnecessary hardship. Um, as you'll see, the size of the property is quite small, um, 2,672 square feet. Um, looking at that, coupled with the fact that it's bisected um, in the middle by the private portion of the Holmes Court right away, are special conditions that distinguish it from surrounding properties. Um, there is no way to add on um, to the existing home or rebuild it or any portion of it um, without requiring zoning relief. Um, so for those reasons, it also can't be used strictly in conformance with the ordinance. Um, I would, um, I, I believe it's fair for the board to also conclude that there is no fair and substantial relationship between the general purpose of the ordinance provisions, particularly the setback provisions here and their application. Um, and finally, the variances um, and the proposed use um, of the property is reasonable. It'll be the same as it exists now, single family use, um, just slightly more functional use. So uh, for these reasons, I hope you'll approve the uh, variances that are sought tonight. Happy to answer any questions you have. Um, Eric on any engineering. Um, Brendan hopefully um, is on and can answer any um, of the design or architectural related questions. So. Okay, thank you. Brendan is on via Zoom. Any questions from the board? Mr. Ram? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So I'll start with my lawyer questions. Um, and then we'll move on to the engineering ones. So Holmes Court, do we know where Holmes Court actually stops? Because yep. the zoning map and the tax map don't mm -hmm. agree. The zoning map has a stop at the property one up from the one that you're talking about right now. Yep. The tax map has the Holmes Court going yep. all the way down to the next property. Yeah, I know. It's, it, it is confusing. To the best of our knowledge and from the research that I did, it ends right at the front boundary of 39. Um, Holmes Court, the property we're talking about, um, and then becomes private through there, which 
makes sense if you think about it. Um, it's not referenced as public or private when you look at the deeds to the properties, um, but I, that's what we were able to ascertain from the title research. Was okay. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the, to answer the question about though maintenance, um, the we do now um, maintain privately. Um, I think thirty nine and forty three. Um, maintain privately, except the city does push snow back through 39, basically to 43, I think out of convenience um, primarily. Um, it's just easier to get it back there and off to the side. Yeah, unfortunately, where, this, where DPW actually plows stuff tends to have almost nothing to do with actual city streets. But uh, it does, though. It's, uh, yeah, sometimes. It, it, it can. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I've had to litigate that issue of the Supreme Court in New Hampshire. But, but in this instance, um, I, I, we feel fairly confident that, the, um, the, uh, that it ends, um, legally speaking, at 39, the front boundary. Okay. Is, is there an easement across 39 for access to 43? Correct. I mean, obviously, under the circumstances, your client owns both pieces of property. But Yes, there, there is. OK, because uh, it's not shown on the, on the plan that you provided. Um, and then I guess uh, architectural question, maybe it'll be easy enough that you can answer it. So uh, the description was that the, the roof dormer was going to be set back two feet from the wall, which in turn is two feet from the property line. But you're asking for just a two foot setback. Um, why would four feet not meet their, your needs for a four, four foot setback from the property line? I think the short answer to that is the closest point of the building is two feet. Um, I, I think it was done out of an abundance of caution in that respect, but um, I think it could be an interpretational thing. I, um, my understanding is is that yes, we will be slightly recessed in, um, but still, I think we were just doing it out of, you know, yeah. so it didn't turn into a debate over you know whether we applied for enough early. Okay. Yeah, and, and really the only evidence I have for yeah. making that is the black and white photo listed as page 5A. There's a note uh, with the nice little um, taped over. This, this is actually very like uh, mid 20th century. I kind of like it, but uh, new recessed shed dormer two foot from sidewall and four foot from gable ends. So so two plus two equals four. So I was it's just curious correct. if there's something that isn't made clear in that description that um, that the board needs to understand about uh, the setback, or if we do genuinely think it'd be something closer to four feet rather than something closer to two feet for that. For that I, I, I believe that that's um, accurate. And then, Brendan, if you want to, um, if there's anything inaccurate about that, certainly speak up. But I do believe that that's accurate. Um, I just know that we're, you know, because the existing um, home does is 2.1 feet from the boundary, we're just being safe with it with the request. Okay, so Brendan McNamara is on Zoom, and we'll let him speak. Yes, that is correct. The um, the setback to the dormer does end up being technically 4.1 feet, um, and uh, but that was uh, not so much generated to get it outside of the setback, but it was a, a visual approach, so that the dormer was was visually uh, recessed from the continuation of the sidewall, so that it it wouldn't be so impactful on the overall building. So in a sense, <clears> that's you know, driven by um, appeals to the HDC rather than the BOA. Any more if questions? that clarifies. Yep. Um, and then my engineering question. Um, and I really, I bring this up because it actually was a problem on a property on Rogers Street, maybe like a year or two ago. Um, we had an applicant that was doing virtually the same thing that you're doing here, which is putting a condenser on the side of the house right up against the property line, and it ran into an issue. So I guess the first question is, is what's driving it being on the side of the house? I guess technically the rear property line, but essentially on the side of the house versus having it on the, the back of the house or what would technically be the side of the, of the property? Like, like, why do we have to have a zero foot setback? Why couldn't we have it on the bat on the other, where we would have at least a little bit of setback to the property line? You prepared? No. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I'll, I can I'll speak that. to that if that's okay. Safe. Yeah, I was going to say, Brendan. Yeah. Uh, so Brendan here again. Yes. So we reviewed uh, putting it on, you know, what would be kind of the rear of the house, um, but in terms of the possibility that it could. Uh, 
produce some sort of annoyance, and that would be annoyance to those neighbours, whereas by putting it on the water side of the house in that narrow setback zone, any annoyance that would be coming from the heat pump would be directed towards 43, which was a common owner, so therefore um, they would be more accepting of it if that was the case. Um, so it was really um, to focus the annoyance to the common owner rather than to somebody who was not involved in the property. Okay. And, and then um, the, the slightly more technical question is, uh, and this is what happened on Rogers Street, it was an issue because the uh, applicant had not included the um, <coughs> space that needs to be between the condenser and the actual building, like you need to have some free space in there for air. There's actually specifications that the manufacturers typically include. Do we know, has that been considered and is that part of the design that you have here? Like we're confident yes, that yes. when you include that space, you're not going to be over the property line. Uh, yes, yes, we, we've accounted for that. So it's, it does end up being on the, the outside face of the unit itself is on the property line, but there's just sufficient space between it and the building for it to function normally. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? <clears throat> no one else. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, would anyone like to speak to, for, or against the application? Seeing no one rise, and is there anyone on Zoom? No? Okay. I'll close the public hearing. And uh, could I have a motion or a discussion on this? Anyone from this side of the dais? <laughs> I would like to move that we approve the application as uh, as presented and advertised. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, Mr. Rayum seconds. Mr. Rossi, a motion, please. Granting the variance uh, would not be contrary to the public interest, uh, which is supported by the fact that the uh, the design, the, uh, the design calls for the addition of a dormer, which doesn't really change the footprint of the structure itself. And the only place where that uh, change is really going to be the most visible is in the adjacent property nearer to the water, which is owned by the same homeowner. So there's really no, um, no impact on the public interest. Um, there's no public interest in preventing the, 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 the construction of a, of a shed dormer. It would do substantial justice because there's no gain to be had to the public uh, by uh, denying this request from the property owner. Uh, there is uh, obviously uh, advantage to the property owner and the value of the property by, uh, by uh, approving the, the requested <coughs> variance. Granting the variance would not diminish the values of the surrounding properties. I think the main uh, supporting fact for that is that the most closely affected property is owned by the same uh, property owner, and uh, that <coughs> person is in the best position to make a judgment as to whether or not the changes they're making on one of their properties would diminish the value. Uh, evidently, they have concluded uh, that it will not. The special provision, uh, the special uh, conditions of the property are that uh, it uh, it's already non-conforming. There's really nothing being done here that changes the degree of non-conformance, other than the heat pumps, and maybe this fact is more along the lines of the first uh, the first criteria. But I do not believe that the intent of the ordinance is to prevent the modernization of HVAC systems in antique sure. homes. Uh, and uh, therefore, I don't think there's any relationship between what they're trying to do. There's no, there's, there's no relationship between their uh, installation of heat pumps and the intent of the ordinance. Okay. Any additional comments for your second, Mr. Ram? I, I do. Thank you. Um, uh, just in general, um, this type of New Englander lends itself to uh, these types of roof dormers. You see them on many different properties um, all over the city. It's a very common way for um, homeowners to add just a little bit of extra usable square footage. Um, those attics are generally pretty tight uh, without having the, the dormer out. And it's, it's often typically seen as a, as a one side. Usually it's the side away from your neighbor 
um, that you that you go and do because uh, then that allows you to because you might have proper setbacks to do it. Um, in in this particular case, um, you know what we are concerned about with. Uh, setbacks is typically light and air to uh, abutting properties, um, to the welfare or the use of the property by your by your neighbors. In this case, conveniently, as uh, Mr. Rossi has pointed out, one of the big factors is is uh, the same owner happens to own, own both properties. So a lot of our many many time concerns that we have for um, for for close setbacks like what we're seing here are are ameliorated to a great effect um, by the fact that uh, that. That there really is common ownership among the two properties. Um, as can be seen in the picture in page 5A, um, window units are, are perfectly allowable, generally tend to be a lot noisier than these uh, more modern um, heat, heat pump condensers that are put on the outside of properties. Zero foot setback, something that normally makes me pretty nervous, but in this particular case, uh, again, because of the property ownership. But in, a, in addition, um, it does sound like it's been, been researched through and they are incredibly quiet, so I really don't think it would be, even if it was put on the back side of the house, probably wouldn't be a concern to the neighbor, but I, I do recognize that the applicant is trying to be a good neighbor uh, and have whatever noise it is making going towards their own property. So, um, you know, I think there's very little in the public interest here that would say that we shouldn't grant this and that, uh, again, one of the unique uh, facts here is that uh, there's a con common ownership across this boundary that is uh, impacted by the request. So with that, I would concur and recommend approval. Mr. Mano? Um, we should add a stipulation pending approval of the HDC. Is that a necessary stipulation? I mean. The property is in the HDC, correct? Right, yeah. and they're, they're before the HDC. Um, it's already been approved? Well, no, it's, yeah. it's they've been to a work session, and they, then they have to come and if the variance is approved, then they can go for full public hearing before the HTC. And the the material, I mean, the visuals of their addition are included in our in our packet. If they deviate from that, then they have to come back to us. Come back, correct. So, okay. Anything else? All right. So the motion is to approve as presented and advertised, um, Mr. Mantle. Yes. Mr. Ram? Yes. Ms. Eldridge? Yes. Mr. Rossi? Yes. Mr. Matson? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Application is approved 6 0. The next application is for 43 Homes Court. And this is the request of Stephen A. and Catherine L. Singler, owners for property located at 43 Homes Court. Whereas relief is needed to demolish the existing dwelling and construct a new single family dwelling, which requires the following. One, variances from section 10.531 to allow a, a lot area of 5,353 square feet where 20,000 square feet is required. B, zero free, uh, feet of street frontage where 100 feet is required. C, 75 feet of lot depth where 100 feet is required. D, a 17-foot front yard where 30 feet is required. E, a 14-foot left side yard where 30 feet is required. And F, a 14-foot right side yard where 30 feet is required. Two, a variance from section 10.440 use number 1.10 to allow a single family dwelling where the use is not permitted. Said property is located on assessor map 101, lot 14, and lies within the waterfront business and historic districts. And who is here to speak to this application? Madam Vice Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, Attorney Derek Durbin again, uh, on behalf of Stephen and Catherine Singlar, who were the applicants in the last um, application before you. Um, they are the owners of 43 Homes Court as well. Uh, so the property we're discussing does contain a single family home uh, constructed um, per the city's assessing records in the year 1749. It has a um, dysfunctional floor plan in its existing condition. Um, my understanding from um, speaking uh, to those with, um, that, that have been in and around the property is it's in very um, poor structural condition as um, I think Stephen would point out to the board. Um, you can poke your finger through some of the um, framing in the, in the, uh, in the house. Um, so it, it does have very um, few qualities that would make it worth um, saving in this particular instance. 
Um, it has two bedrooms, um, one bathroom. Um, that's unfortunately the bathroom that is in the existing house is on the first floor, um, which is uh, obviously inconvenient having um, the bedrooms upstairs. Uh, the home is located within the AE flood zone. Um, it has a flood elevation of eight feet. Um, and for those of us that don't, um, aren't engineers or don't um, look at flood elevations a lot, um, it just basically means it's extremely um, prone, uh, prone to flooding uh, from the, due to the close proximity of the Piscataqua River. Um, uh, the home um, is uh, uniquely situated. Um, there are no other homes immediately abutting it to the sides um, or to the rear. To the rear, obviously, is the Piscataqua River. Uh, the abutting uh, property to the front at 39 Homes Court is also owned by the Singlars. Um, all the other um, properties on Homes Court are zoned GRB. This is the only um, one that's zoned um, uh, waterfront business. The property is, um, technically speaking, landlocked, um, save for the private access that we just talked about in the last application uh, that runs from the public portion of the Homes Court right away um, from the front boundary of 39 Homes Court um, back to this particular property. Um, the um, existing home um, cannot be uh, raised, to meaning like physically raised up to mitigate the current flood risks while also meeting um, building and life safety codes. Um, really the only feasible plan for the property um, to mitigate those concerns as well as to modernize the property is to um, demolish the existing home. Uh, the applicants are proposing the construction of a new two bedroom, um, two bath single family home uh, it would be of a slightly larger dimension, um, but it would be essentially equivalent to or e even smaller than some of the other homes um, that are um, on Holmes Court. Um, the ceiling height of each floor would be raised. Um, right now it's uh, like, a, a, you know, it's a very low ceiling, so it's a very difficult um, home to navigate around. Um, there are a lot of safety issues as well um, with the existing home. The finished product would have approximately 1,300 square feet of finished living space. We're still talking about a very small home. Um, there would be an additional bathroom um, added to the second floor of the home to make it a little more functional. Um, the new flood elevation would be 11 feet, um, thus mitigating the, the uh, future flood risks. Um, I know, you know, with any type of application like this, there's always going to be the, you know, why, why do we need to demolish? Um, the existing home? Does it have historic quality? Um, is it worth saving? Um, I've alluded and touched upon some of the, the reasons why it should be demolished. Um, but again, since we have Brendan um, on Zoom um, appearing from Australia, I'd like to just have him at this point just discuss some of those, um, some of the reasons behind the um, demolition of the existing home um, and its rebuild, because I think it, it is important for this board. So, Brendan? Yes, exactly. I'm here. Um, the, uh, this house ends up being caught in a bit of a catch-22 um, because there's a technical requirement uh, once you've exceeded a, a level of expenditure on the house that it must meet um, current code, which would mean it would mean need to meet the um, coastal flood zone requirements. So. Um, so you could sort of say, well, we could just lift up the existing house, but the act of lifting up the existing house would exceed the expenditure that would then initiate the rest of the house to meet current code, which dimensionally the existing house can't. So um, that's what we've proposed is, is a, a rebuild of a slightly expanded version um, of the appearance of the existing structure. Um, we've reviewed this quite extensively um, with the HDC, and they uh, were, um, you know, in the end, you know, we all realised that it'd be nice to maintain uh, a historic structure. Although this one has been quite savagely um, cut into and changed over time, but um, the generalised appearance of the existing house would be preserved in a, a slightly larger envelope that allows the dimensional requirements of the current code to be met in terms of stairs, headroom requirements, et cetera, et cetera, um, all within the context of this raising up 
for the um, floodplain, coastal floodplain requirements, um, which is essentially, you know, causing a lift up of at least two feet, I think it is. So that's the generalised approach. Um, I actually have a, a question. Well, I'll let you get through your application. I have a question on that on that point. Okay. Um, so uh, despite the relatively small um, size of the lot, I mean, a lot of these um, properties out there are re relatively small along Holmes Court. Um, it will comply with the building coverage requirements for both the WB um, waterfront business zoning and the GRB zoning, um, which is interesting because with waterfront business zoning, it's a minimum lot area, 20,000 square feet, and um, GRB is significantly less, but it will comply with both. Um, with the reconstruction of the home, they are proposing several offsetting improvements. Um, the shed that's located in the left side yard. Um, set back along the northerly boundary um, will be um, demolished. Um, in addition, there's a stone patio to the rear of the existing home um, that extends um, pretty close to um, what, what you could consider the bank uh, to the Piscataqua River. Um, that will be um, removed. Um, there will be a deck added to the back of the home, but that will be under 18 inches um, uh, above grade, so it, it doesn't require any type of relief. Um, those changes may seem minor, but they are overall improvements to the property in its existing condition. Um, as uh, Brendan pointed out, um, this will need HTC approval. It has gone through that work session. That's where the determinations um, have been made. Um, really, the, the only feasible option is to demolish and reconstruct here. Um, it has um, received favorable feedback for the HTC, which is the reason we're, we're here tonight. Um, the uh, applicants will need a, a wetlands permit as well for um, the work that's done on the property. Um, the, um, it has been designed to comply with the wetland requirements, um, which mitigates any environmental related concerns. Um, it does appear like a lot of variance has been applied for um, on paper, um, but I would point out that they all relate to existing nonconformities of the property. Um, the only nonconformity that's arguably um, increasing is really related to the front yard setback, um, which is, is really an interesting point. Um, if, if you look at um, my narrative and, and some of the foot, footnotes in there, um, front yard setback is, is measured from the edge of the public street. Um, in this instance, um, you know, we've applied for variance relief, but the reality is, is that um, if you were to apply that definition um, as it reads in the ordinance, we don't have a front yard. Um, it's, so it is a very unique situation. Um, we did apply for the relief. Um, rather than have it omitted and, and end up in a debate um, over whether it's needed, um, but the reality is there's no front yard here. So it is a very unique situation. Um, I also, um, at this point, just need to, to raise an issue, um, which I've discussed with the city in the past, um, but there's never been, I think, at least, um, any consensus between myself and the city that relief is needed for the dimensions of the lot. Um, we have applied for frontage lot area relief, all those things, but the reality is, is that this is an existing lot of record with vested rights um, under the law. Um, we don't feel that any of the variances related to the dimensions of the lot itself as it exists um, are applicable here and should be um, required. So. Uh, I raise these issues because I'm about to address the variance criteria, so I didn't know if the board, I know um, Beth has a question um, that may be related to design, but I wanted to raise those as preliminary issues because I didn't know if the board wanted to possibly discuss that. Um, and really, when I talk about dimensions, front yard setback, um, lot area, depth, um, and also there's the issue of the front yard. I know I don't like to throw complicating factors in the application, but I mean, it it makes it look like we're applying for a tremendous amount of relief when the reality is, is that, that we're not. Um, and I, I, I don't think there's ever been a legal determination, at least maybe Peter knows better than, than I do, um, from the city, at least on paper, that says you do need this relief. I think it's just generally been accepted by applicants that you do. But I, I've, I, I think in most other municipalities, you define what a lot of record is, and the city of Portsmouth does not. Um, you know, where you have vested rights, where those start and where they end. 
And I, I mean, we're dealing with, an, for lack of better words, an ancient property here. Um, so I don't, that, that's not to say that the use rights are allowed because we're in WB zoning. And we definitely need a use variance, but the dimensional variances, um, I think, are, are questionable. Well, it is a, a non-conforming building, <laughs> so it's a non-conforming yes. lot, which year. So I think, and this is the way Portsmouth has sure. handled this. So I I'll think, address them. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be better just to address them. Yeah, I will. Criteria. Yeah, I, and again, it's, it's not my point to put the board on, on the spot here on, with that, <coughs> those issues, but it, I mean, hopefully it's an issue. That those are issues the city can work through in the future. But we did apply um, with the reservation that we don't feel that they're necessary. So, um, Beth, I know you had a question, so before. I think we should let you finish okay. your criteria, because I think how many do you okay. have? Sure. You only have three minutes left. So Got I think, it. Okay. So why don't we at this point, would the board uh, allow uh, Attorney Durbin an additional five okay. minutes? Okay. Um, granting the variance does not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the zoning ordinance. Um, uh, so as I pointed out, um, with the last application, um, with respect to the building setback requirements, really intended to preserve light, air, and space between buildings on abutting properties. This will accomplish those goals. Um, it won't add any additional burden on surrounding properties. It'll only extend two feet closer to the front boundary, um, which of course is a property that's commonly owned um, by the Singlars. Um, most, if not all the other um, houses on Holmes Court are located um, closer than 20 feet to their front boundaries. Um, we are making improvements to the site, removal of the patio, removal of the shed in the left yard setback. Um, I would submit to the board that the WB waterfront business zoning designation for the property isn't reflective of the character of this particular neighborhood, um, which is uh, the remainder of the homes are zoned GRB, where the setbacks would be five feet from the front, 10 feet to the sides, and 25 feet to the rear. So if zoned consistently um, with the other um, properties in the neighborhood, um, the rebuild arguably wouldn't require any of that dimensional relief. Um, so in this case, the uh, granting the variance does not alter the essential character of the neighborhood, um, and the construction of a new co-compliant home on the property will observe the uh, public interest, life safety um, goals of the ordinance, um, as well as the aesthetic goals of the ordinance. Um, we will be providing, I think, an overall improvement um, that will benefit surrounding properties, certainly not diminish their values. Um, uh, with respect to substantial justice, um, it will be done by granting the variance relief. The demolition of the home, reconstruction of a slightly larger footprint um, will allow for a more functional home, uh, mitigate the flood risks, and, uh, and will meet, meet current life and safety codes. Uh, denying the variances would constitute an unnecessary hardship. Uh, it does have a number of very prominent special conditions that distinguish it from surrounding properties. Um, very small buildable um, envelope on the property. Um, property is already non-conforming with respect to the setbacks, lot area, frontage, and depth. Um, it's the only um, property in otherwise residential area um, that is zoned waterfront business. Um, and I, I would also submit to the board that the waterfront business um, designation was really intended to apply to these larger lots that could be utilized for, for true marine purposes, um, which this could not um, in, in any case. Um, Property is also landlocked, um, in theory, accessed by a private drive, um, so it doesn't have that typical front yard that we talk about, um, which front yard setback provision, if you were to look at, is really to design to promote a, sort of a more uniform or consistent streetscape with properties to um, make sure they're kind of equally set back so that uh, there's uniformity on the street. Um, in this instance, that those considerations really aren't present. Um, so um, finally, the um, property is also abutted to the rear by the Piscataqua River, which is a unique um, circumstance that really sets it apart um, from many other, um, at least the other properties on Holmes Court itself. Um, so for these reasons, there is no fair and substantial relationship between the general purpose of the ordinance provisions, their application of the property. Um, the use itself um, is the historical use of the property, which is single family residential. Um, that use is inconsistent with waterfront business zoning, but is consistent um, with the other uses in the surrounding area. So for those reasons, we believe it's reasonable. And I will um, conclude my presentation at this point to try to comply with your time requirements. And I thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. I have Brendan and Eric is here. 
here as well to answer questions, and Stephen Singlar as well. So thank you. Any questions from the board? Down here? Yeah, I'm confused about one thing um, with reference with regard to uh, what lots in the area are zoned waterfront business. Uh, I'm looking at the map that you kindly provided. Uh, I don't know, the pages aren't really numbered, so it's kind of hard for me to sure. point to a page, but perhaps you know which one I'm talking about. It's got a kind of a mustard colored area and shows the zoning yeah. <clears throat> in the area. Correct. Um, Aren't a number of those, aren't all those grayed out lots waterfront business? Um, they're not used for waterfront business purposes, but they're all, uh, yes, zoned consistently as waterfront business. So basically everything along the shoreline. 1017 actually is used as a waterfront business. I'm sorry, which number? The, the one. Just there there just is. Right, um, just right next to it. Uh, not exactly right next to it, but um, yes, if you were to look, um, if you were looking at the property, 43 Homes Court from the front, um, to your left, if you look out a ways um, mm -hmm. towards the water, you would be looking at a property that is used for waterfront business purposes, yes. I believe that's owned by the Sanders. Yes. Family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, from my yeah. view of the area. Yes. The property right, I think the property, though, that's right next door to the left is um, my recollection. That's single family. Residential. Is it? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, like if you, like it's. It, I mean, it's hard to say to, to the the left because I think you know it. The coastline jogs, but yeah, yeah. One hundred one dash eighteen. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions from down One hundred one dash eighteen is used residentially, but it's waterfront business zoned. That's not what you're saying. That's correct. Yeah. But one hundred one dash seven looks like it has some. Commercial use. That's commercially right. used. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess, so, you know, I'm just kind of scratching my head um, thinking about the intent of the waterfront business zone. There's not that much waterfront to be had to preserve for business uses. And, um, you know, by granting this variance, we would be continuing to restrict the little amount of waterfront that's available uh, for business use. And I'm struggling a little bit with the. Uh, uh, the propriety of that. Sure. Yeah, um, just to ad address that particular concern, obviously if the variances were denied, it would continue to exist as single-family residential, but I think the, the risk that we run there is is that you're trying to then work with a home that is um, dysfunctional, for lack of better words, and <clears throat> not... I mean, they, they will, they'll, they'll continue to use it for single-family residential purposes, but I think improving it... Um, in a way that makes sense becomes very challenging. It also doesn't mitigate the flood risks. Mm -hmm. And I think they'll try to just work with what exists because financially speaking, it wouldn't make sense to abandon the use, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're saying that the fact that it's already in residential use is a special condition of the property that, Correct. that uh, creates a, a hardship, basically? That um, it's it's one of, of yeah, issues. several. Yes, I would, I, would, I would argue that, yeah. Any other questions? Looking to this side of the dais, any questions, Mr. Mayo? Any questions, Mr. Mayo? Okay. All right. So my question is: the flood zone is at eight feet. The city's flood zone has an extra other foot over it, nine feet. Nine. So um, why not apply for a variance for relief from that extra foot? Of. Of the height, the to get it out of the flood zone. I think, you know, in terms of looking at the property and what exists on it as a whole, um, I think that the true intent really is to improve the property and really to eliminate, uh, it may be nine feet, but I think the reality is looking ahead at the future and what um, risks potentially are posed with respect to the property, the existing structure, I think, um, the, the, the best, I think, and most appropriate approach for the property is to, to demo and, and build at a higher um, elevation just to mitigate, um, I think, probably what, I mean, we have minimum standards, oh, Farrakh wants to address, but we have minimum standards, obviously, we want to try to go and look proactively at the, at the future. Yes. 
Eric Weinrub, Altus. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the flood ordinance is if there's substantial renovation that it actually has to be lifted to one foot above. But for new construction, it's actually two feet above. And I think that gives us some, what I'll say, the, what Derek was trying to say is the buffer for not just, you know, the new FEMA ordinances that came out, uh, the maps that came out in January 2021, but also climate change. You know, we are looking for resiliency and trying to protect our waterfront properties. And by raising that up, we're not looking at just the next 10 years. We're looking at the 30, 40, 50 years. Okay. I mean, I asked because you probably don't know this. We had an ordinance request for the, the school. What was it? The, the one that's Lady out. Bell. Yeah. The, the barn. barn. Yeah. The barn. Yeah, right. For the barn, it was for, for ex, uh, a variance request so that 16% of it would not have to comply with our nine foot uh, yeah. flood zone. So that's, that's where that question came. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with that one. And I'm not sure as a barn, it's a little bit different than an occupied structure where you're having um, all your mechanicals and, and, and everything inside there. So the barn may not be um, fully occupied in the same manner. Okay, thank you. And um, so I, I realize the demolition of this property is going to be dealt with by the Historic District Commission. However, one of the criteria that we have when we are in the Historic District is the preservation of historic structures. Sure. And that is something we have to deal with when we're in the district, not when we're outside of the district. So, um, you know, I, 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 I guess the property is in some rough shape, as are a lot of historic structures um, in the city. And the, the you know, development of the historic district was to make it so that they were not demolished. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could address that and mm -hmm. why it really needs to be demolished. Yeah, um, I, I know um, uh, we have Brennan on as well um, since he went through the HDC process that can speak from personal knowledge as to um, what that board favors. But I, um, some of the things obviously that I've touched upon um, is it, it is in, um, in Beth, you're, you're right in pointing out that the, a lot of these historic homes obviously have a lot of features that are would be very difficult to salvage, um, you know, and people still try to work with them and salvage them. Um, in this instance, my understanding is it, it is in such rough shape. There's, there is not a lot um, to salvage, um, as well as, um, you know, <clears throat> we're also balancing this, um, the, the, the flood elevation issue and trying to mitigate future flood risks. Um, Brennan, if you want to speak to the HDC process, um, I, my understanding from the HDC process as well is, is the HDC favors a demolition um, in, in this particular instance. But Brennan, if you want to speak um, specifically to that. Yes, um, so we uh, did a, a site walk with the HDC to, do, to review the, um, the situation of the structure um, even though um, the original structure is you know, said to have been built in the 1700s, and it certainly is undeniable when you go into the basement, um, the, um, the first floor floor structure um, it has evidence of the original hand-hewn beams um, and uh, you know, cut log beams. Um, but um, the actual exterior appearance um, is of the late 1800s. It has those you know, gothic kind of dormer things that are happening. So it's it's been reworked a number of times, and there's very little except in the first floor structure of the original structure left. The um, the foundation is there. Um, however, that has been uh, back poured with concrete against the um, the original stone foundation. Um, and that's all kind of falling apart. Um, so in terms above the first floor, it has been you know, bastardised you know, for the last 150 years, really. Um, and so even the roof structure on, that you see on the building at the moment, even though we're, we're replicating that roof structure, would not have been original to the house. Um, it's re that was really just in deference to the visual expectation of the neighbours in the neighbourhood. 
So, um, and the other issue is that, so we're working on a design flood elevation at 11, which was the requirement of the AE zone in that area. So the floor lift up is actually, uh, technically it's 14 inches, one foot two. But again, we fall into this issue, which we address with the HTC, that the, the requirements under the building code, because of the extent of the expenditure even just to lift the existing structure, which wouldn't be worth it, it means that you are going to being forced to um, adhere to current code on all other aspects of the building. So that's what drives the need for demolition. That essentially, it's either do nothing with the structure and just allow it to fall down around the owner's ears, or or actually do something but once you do something you exceed the uh, the expenditure level that forces you to meet code requirements so you can't keep it at the same dimension okay thank you it's a it's a real problem for coastal buildings for sure and the hdc recognized that as well and you know saw had an extensive discussion on it okay thank you and my last question is the waterfront b um it is true that's that the city has has zoned this, and this is slightly different from the other the um, art studio in that this <clears> is an existing non-conforming use. Um, however, why can't I mean just think of hardship? Why can't you convert this building to a commercial use? I mean, there are other waterfront businesses in that area. There definitely are, and there are further down on, on off of you know further up. Sure. I mean, it would have to be a very, number one, it'd have to be a very small um, waterfront marine related use. I mean, it certainly doesn't lend itself to the storage of boats, other things of that nature. Um, even to the extent that it did, you are, um, if you walk down to the property, you are really feeling like you're in a residential neighborhood. You don't feel that you're in a, a waterfront business area, which, again, looking at the minimum requirements for WB zoning, dimensional requirements, you're dealing with what was intended to be much larger tracts of land, tracts of land that are nearly four times the size of this, really designed to promote those marine, truly marine uses, not just the passive sort of, hey, we sell clothes that have a mooring on the front or something, a buoy. Um, to the extent that you could put a marine use in there, I would argue it would probably constitute a nuisance. Um, to the neighbors. Um, you would need to um, access it through a private right away, um, through a residential property. I'm sure there's, um, at least I can think of a number of potential legal challenges to that. Um, and then the um, you know other issue is to the extent that you're storing anything outdoors or in having any type of volume of traffic up and down that right away. I, I would argue you're probably that use would be inconsistent with the general prevailing character of the um, of that particular neighborhood. I think it is kind of like you can't just look at the whole area. I think in this instance you got to look at Holmes Court and sort of like the you have those streets that run um, parallel to it as well to the um, Newcastle side, and it really has a residential feel to it. Um, I think, the right, I think the right of way access is a, it would be a big problem. I mean, yeah. I went down there with my truck uh, earlier today. Yeah, and it's uh, tough. I yeah. can only imagine backing a boat trailer down that, <laughs> that little yeah. alley. It'd be terrible. It, 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 yeah, it, it is tough. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, you know I, I have a little car, and it was, yeah, I mean, it's, there's, yeah, there's no it's an interesting um, situation. There's also not, obviously, a lot of um, you know, parking out there. We, we can... We have enough to park the cars for the house, but it's not a lot out there. Um, a big, big enough land area, really, for that. So, you know, it's a, it is, it is a. I mean, we say this. There's special. Everybody comes up here and argues special conditions. And this, this says a lot, actually. Um, it's a, it is truly unique in its environment. Um, Any other questions or concerns from the board, David? <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. I had no questions. Right. Uh oh, I must have done something wrong. Then. <laughs> um, uh, 
Uh, okay, thank you. Yes, Attorney thank Gerber. you very much. <laughs> Is there anyone here who would like to speak to, for, or against the application? Uh, is no one's rising. Is there anyone on Zoom? No. Okay. All right, um, then I will close the public hearing and I will look for a discussion or a motion from the board. I was concerned about the uh, residential use in the WB <coughs> district, but. I think the argument that it's already in residential use and will remain so uh, regardless is compelling. And I just think that makes the WB issue kind of superfluous. Okay. Anything else from anyone? Mr. Ram? Yeah, so, you know, waterfront business, um, as the acting chair pointed out, um, really very precious obviously only so much many properties that uh, that could even potentially fall into it um, it's, it's it's a relatively small presence uh, right along the waterfront in this area in general I am a big advocate of protecting every every potential square inch of that that we can and I think this board has done that in the past and I, I've been uh, someone to try and defend that but that said um, this particular property, I think, is just so different and so isolated. Um, you know, I, I think the intent when we included it and the neighboring property into the waterfront business was thinking that there might be some way, some somehow, of of redoing it. But just from a practical standpoint, as has been pointed out, I, I just think it would be a, a negative overall to try and say that we want to try and squeeze some actual business in a place that hasn't had one in certainly some very long period of time. Uh, maybe maybe it was a, you know, a, a, a place that a fisherman lived and somehow got to see by, um, you know, right off of their own property. But that, that use and that type of use has long since uh, passed. Um, I think really realistically, the Sanders use and, is, you know, there's some more open space in there that uh, once you come down Partridge Street, you can kind of sort of access that more open area. It makes more sense. Here you really have a property that is completely isolated from the others. Um, I, I, I do think that just the nature of Holmes Court is, is such that it, it would be impractical to come up with something that would that would justify saying that it's really contributing to the characteristics of the waterfront business. Because, you know, in all of the um, charrettes and uh, things that I've participated in when we come up with our master plan, you hear it repeatedly, and I think it's a great thing for our city to to want to try and preserve as much of our waterfront and keep it as a business, um, you know, keep that vibrancy aspect to our, our waterfront still. Um, you hear it, but it just in this particular case, it just it just doesn't work. So, in, in that sense, I think this this property makes makes sense to remain a residential use, and within that confine, then if you really do look at if it's not truly a waterfront business, then a lot of the parameters that are called for in that zone with the 30 foot setbacks, with the large lots, right? It's assuming a much larger lot than what we have here, 20,000 square feet. It's assuming with that, that you, you can afford the, the, the 30 foot setbacks that with this much, much smaller lot, it's really much more like it's residential neighbors that are in the, uh, the, the GR, uh, GRB zone um, and probably would be better suited with that. And as the applicant's, uh, you know, attorney has pointed out, the, the what is being proposed is actually fully in compliance with the GRB. In fact, they probably could, could make a bigger structure, but I don't want to go and allow them to do that. I mean, I think what they're what they're proposing is a reason, relatively reasonable size for a waterfront property, and 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 shouldn't be any any larger. But I do believe that it's allowed. And then, you know, in terms of Demolishing a historic structure, I'm the first to always lament losing a historic property, but um, I also trust the expertise of the HDC members. Sounds like they are doing their due diligence in going through the property, looking at it, understanding it from a truly what is what is there left historically. Uh, you know, certainly looking at at the building, I would agree with um, with the applicant's architect that it doesn't doesn't have any distinguishing characteristics that make me say, wow, that's a, that's something that's really unique, really historic, um, it preserves all of these really uh, great things that we shouldn't get rid of. It's really kind of at this point been converted into sort of this mishmash of styles, uh, mishmash of conversions, mishmash of a new uh, new appendages on it. And, and it's true historic value to us, other than saying it's this old thing from 1760 or some portions of it are, 
um, is is not realistic. So those are my thoughts. Mr. Meinl, do you have any thoughts? Um, I am going to say, is anybody else? Because I don't want to speak before everybody else. I will not be supporting this application. Um, I recognize that demolition was in the, is within the purview of the HTC. I did not find, with all due respect, the applicant's arguments against for demolishing the building persuasive. There are many buildings that have different elements of it from different time periods. Um, the foundation, there are many buildings that in the south end have had to be lifted and put new foundations on top of it. Uh, underneath it and so um, in that I feel like it does fail the spirit and intent um, I think it's a nifty little structure I think it's very appealing um, I uh, so I will not be supporting this application um, and um, I would I don't know what the the sense of the board is but I'll await a motion or <laughs> Well, I'll test the waters. Uh, I would move to approve the application as submitted and advertised. We'll see what kind of support there is for that. I'll second. I'll second. Uh, your motion, Mr. Rossi? Well, I think the uh, overarching issue here is the fact that uh, we're trying to judge the compliance of this residential use property according to the standards of the waterfront business. Uh, use uh, zone criteria and for all practical purposes uh, that is just a misapplication of those standards uh, this is not a property that lends itself to the intended purpose of waterfront business and uh, therefore I think it should be judged uh, more in accordance with the residential use uh, in the surrounding zoned areas <clears throat> and that's, I think that's the relevant fact that speaks to essentially all of the variance evaluation criteria, and I'm not going to repeat them uh, one by one. Well, we do have to go through the... <laughs> but I would just be saying the same thing <laughs> over and over again, <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. Do so you could, do, you could add that to the notes. Uh, do you have anything to add to your second, Ms. Elbert? I agree with everything that Mr. Rossi said. Um, and while we don't need to go over all of the dimensional variance needs, we do have to, I believe, say why we think a variance based on those yes. Yes. is desirable. Um, and I do think it is because it's almost, first of all, I'll go back to the waterfront business. I, I, I agree with, um, with David that it's very impractical on a private road to have a, biz a going business concern that one street over is an entirely different situation. But here I believe that it would be almost, given that it is a residential use and we believe it should be judged that way, there's really no way it can meet these criteria being on the lot that it's on. And therefore, um, do you want to go back and do that? <laughs> Therefore, granting the variance would not be contrary to the public because this residential use in what's basically a residential street area um, seems appropriate. It observes the spirit of the ordinance, and there would be no um, granting it would do substantial justice to how this property has been used over many years and um, suggesting that it really belongs in another zoning district just doesn't seem to me to be just, given the concerns of the private road of the neighborhood. <coughs> um, it would not diminish the values of the surrounding properties. In fact, it would probably increase the value. And while this is a sweet house, I do believe that floodplain concerns and the weakness of the structure and the fact that the, the body that allows demolition has ruled it's okay would, um, that's okay with me. I, I think that there's a reason that this building can be torn down and a new building will increase property values. The hardships are, um, are many. It's that 
I'm Kim, I'm jump in. Yeah, would you do this? I wasn't prepared. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to jump, dump all that on you. I think the uh, special uh, condition of the property uh, is that it is essentially landlocked and the access to it is extremely restricted uh, and that prohibits the use in the way that the zoning ordinance uh, speaks to, which is as waterfront business. And that, that is the hardship. Okay. Thank you. Is there any additional discussion or? I'll just throw on the mud. Well, since we're talking about the waterfront businesses, um, <clears throat> if this was the streets next door, which is the loop around Prey or Pickering Mechanic, mm -hmm. I'd agree with preserving the waterfront area. If the applicant came in, and needed variances in order to change this back to a waterfront business, in my estimation, they'd probably fail on at least two, if not three of the five criteria, even though they could do the waterfront business by right because the surrounding areas have changed so dramatically and you're on a dead end street. So I'll be supporting the application. Okay, thank you. So um, the motion is to approve as granted and as I'm sorry presented and advertised. Uh, let's start skip, with we can Mr. Matson. <laughs> yes. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Rossi. Yes. Ms. Eldridge. Yes. Mr. Rayum. Yes. Mr. Mantle. Yes. And the chair votes now. It passes five to one. Thank you. Um, sure. No, I, I guess um, we have reached our witching hour. It is uh, ten o'clock, and we have three more applications yep. to get to the end. So I'll just need a motion to go past ten o'clock. So, so moved. Second. <laughs> Everybody in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And the next application is six fifty three Greenland Road. It is the request of Luke J. Brindamore and Sarah C. Brindamore for property located at 653 Greenland Road, whereas relief is needed to add an eight feet tall fence, which requires the following. One, a variance from section 10.515.13 to allow an eight foot tall fence along the property line and not adhering to the required yard setbacks. Said property is located on assessor map 259 lot 31 and lies within the single residence B district. And who is here to speak to this application? Hi, uh, this is Luke Brindamore by Zoom. Sorry, I'm finishing a 12 hour drive back from West Virginia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, please continue. <laughs> uh, so this is my first foray into variances and boards of adjustment and Stephanie and Peter have been uh, instrumental in sort of guiding me through this process. Uh, my wife and I moved from Rhode Island to Portsmouth. Uh, her family's been in Rye for the last 30 years and we both came here to work at Exeter Hospital. Um, and so we purchased this house on 653 Greenland Road. Um, and when we purchased it, it had an existing stretch of fence that was eight foot tall uh, along uh, the border between 42 Harvard in our property and then there's a six foot bent piece of fence uh, that's discontinuous oh. with the eight foot fence um the former being around 100 foot the six foot being around probably 50 foot uh between that and 623 greenland and so you know we're hoping to essentially uh reuse repurpose uh the existing piece of eight foot fence for the majority of the perimeter and continue it and then leverage the existing piece of the six foot fence to taper it uh, appropriately to, to the street. Um, the intention is to maintain the integrity of the neighborhood aesthetic uh, with cedar fencing. Um, we've spoken with both neighbors, um, uh, Bevancourt uh, and her mother at 42, <coughs> as well as uh, Christy, uh, who is at 623 Greenland. Um, while they're probably not present, uh, they you know both are in support of all of, uh, of this work and you know, the hope is to sort of totally contain the yard uh, with a fence eventually uh, so that our dog can play, our future family can play, and it's all safe and contained while maintaining privacy. 
Um, Mr. Brindamore, if you could please um, uh, address the variance criteria. Uh, could you provide some guidance on that? I'm, I apologize. Okay, well, we can follow your submission. Um, and the beginning of the first page of your submission is the variance will not be contrary to the public interest. Uh, yeah, that, that's correct. I don't think it will be contrary to the public interest. Uh, I think the spirit of the ordinance is def will, will certainly be uh, observed. Um, you know, to, to not leverage the existing fence would create some degree of hardship, financially speaking. Um, uh, any other ask? Can you, is there another page for me to? Uh, yes. Uh, the spirit of the ordinance will be observed. I, I, yeah, I definitely believe so. And I, I believe substantial justice will be done. I think it will uh, certainly benefit us without adversely affecting our neighbors. Um, if anything, it would be probably property value positive or neutral. It certainly wouldn't take away from, from it, uh, from ourselves or our neighbors. Um, I certainly don't think they'd be diminished. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't think it would uh, result in any kind of unnecessary hardship to anyone else. Okay. Sorry if I'm not doing this 100% uh, correctly. <laughs> okay. Um, I will ask if the board has any questions for Mr. Brindamore. Well, you have some. Oh, sorry. I started looking over there. Yeah, you guys that's, do this. That's right. I, I was patient. <laughs> Mr. Mantle, I'll start with you. Um, Mr. Brindamore. Um, yes, sir. If I'm reading your application correctly, you're not putting a new fence no, he is. up around the back side of your he property. You're connecting the gaps in your fence that were basically from your abutters, would, correct? Uh, Yes and no. Essentially, we would be using the existing parts of the fence that already exist. Uh, we would want to use all of the existing eight-foot fence and all of the existing six-foot fence uh, for the length that they currently exist. You know, we, I've talked to fencing companies, and they actually would, you know, we wouldn't have to waste anything. Essentially, um, we would make the predominant height around the perimeter of the property eight foot and taper it appropriately to, to six feet uh, where, it, where it's required to be shorter uh, towards the actual uh, front of the roads. So we would be connecting it, it would, it, but it's mostly sort of uh, patchwork and tetrising the pieces where they really would belong. So it's not, you know, eight foot, six foot, eight foot, six foot, eight foot, six foot. It's, you know, six foot tapers up to eight foot, tapers down to six foot. So it's, uh, you know, Okay. A much thank more natural, much more natural look, you know. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ram. Yes, uh, thank you. This is uh, Board Member Dave Ram. So, um, w on one of your photos, and unfortunately, there's no page number or reference here, but um, one of your photos that you have here um, shows your current eight-foot fence that I believe is a, a, a butting against your neighbor's. Uh, property and it does say new line from survey. So you had a survey done, and it now shows that you have at the far end a four foot gap there. Is that what I'm to understand? Yeah. So we had um, when we moved in uh, as part of sort of the due diligence for any future work. I thought it was appropriate to perform a survey and have it recorded with the city, and then inform my neighbors of the findings of the survey. Uh, to then propose future work, you know, in the spirit of neighborliness. Um, and so, yes, the survey was uh, done, recorded. Where, the, where it's delineated, that's the perimeter uh, that you see in orange there. Um, the survey actually where that eight-foot fence currently exists, uh, it's really just a few, it, from where the street is, that's actually the best picture that represents sort of the change, really. Um, where the eight foot, that top one of the two that you're referencing. So it really is, you know, taking the back of that eight foot fence and sort of swinging the tail end out slightly. Um, so at the back, the maximum is four feet. At the front, it's essentially no change at all. Um, so it's sort of hinging out very slightly uh, to it with into, uh, well, I guess it's on our property line, but, um, Betty from 42 Harvard uh, and her mother, whose property is, are aware of that, and it's staked out currently, um, and they are okay with 
with the fence going there, but we would use the existing fence there and just sort of hinge it to that area. Okay, so your intent to is... To encompass that area, excuse me. Right, your intent is to move your fence closer to the property line as you now understand it following your survey. Correct, that's correct. Okay, and then heading through the treed area, um, looking at that same photo sort of as you go towards the left, also again see some stake markers there that look like they're running top of a tree, but your intent is to uh, continue along that uh, property line with your eight foot fence as, as close as practical, is that what you're, you're looking at? That's correct, and we would remove uh, a tree that's in the way. Okay. Uh, and then there's sort of like some topography elements there where it does appear like there's a little hill and, and valley. Is it your expectation that the eight feet will sort of mimic that um, topography, or are you going to try and keep like a level eye level um, to the fencing uh, so the actual height of the fence will be shorter where the topography would have it, um, where it kind of goes up and then dips back down again? Does that make sense? It does make sense. We have a landscaper uh, who is able to sort of work with uh, the fence folks to eventually uh, level things out if they were to sort of undulate, like you're suggesting. Um, the intention is to make it as uniform as humanly possible. Okay, thank you. Any questions from? Yeah, the, <clears throat> the eight foot fence that's gonna be uh, rotated, I'm sorry, I'm not- oh, No, no, go ahead. Uh, the eight foot fence that's gonna be sort of rotated around uh, is that your fence or your neighbor's fence? Our fence. That's your fence, okay. And I still don't quite understand the logic of why the new fencing has to be eight feet and not six feet. Well, it's it's a stretch of like essentially a hundred feet of existing eight foot fence. Um, in you know, having spoken with our neighbor, Christy at 623, she supports and prefers actually eight foot fence. Um, you know, her mother, I think, lives in a detached ADU. She has young children. Uh, we have a dog. We're going to have a young family soon, and I think she prefers it as well. Um, there are 42 Harvards are also going to be having, uh, a, I think, an apartment that's getting put there that's sort of on the second level. Um, and so being in the yard from a privacy sake, that extra two feet when you're looking at an angle does provide afforded privacy to us, and our neighbors actually support it too. It's not that we're not neighborly at all. I, you know, we. You know, I think when I introduced ourselves to the neighborhood, we wrote this letter, uh, gave our contact information. They said that was kind of the most people have communicated with one another in a while. So I think it was uh, it was welcomed. And the purpose of the fence height is not to 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 you know fracture uh, us, uh, but really I think you know you utilize the existing height and have it be uniform aesthetically speaking, um, where there's a hundred feet of it and fifty ish feet of the shorter fence that makes sense to having spoken with the fence people and the landscapers to use that to sort of taper it uh, down to the, um, you know, the picture that's below it where there's the gate, it would taper down to that six foot height, probably two to three panels of the 50 foot on that side and two to three panels of the, that 50 foot section um, where it's gonna connect to the side of the house uh, on the other side. So um, it's really leveraging what exists. Um, just to repurpose as much as we can, and it sort of has the positive externality of a bit of a privacy benefit. Would he would he still require a variance? If it was a six foot fence in this exact. I'm not talking about moving the existing eight foot fence. I'm talking about the six foot fence. Would that still require a variance? Not along the rear of the property. There is a the new section I'm talking about. Right. So there's a whole there's several new sections of eight foot fence along the rear. Mm -hmm. If they were six feet, they would not require variance. So the um, only reason he's here for a variance is because he wants eight feet instead of six feet. Correct, but there that's is also correct. there is also a portion that's going to taper to six feet that's in the front yard. Oh, and that that's should part be of four this. foot. That could, that could, if that was if that was four feet, that um, wouldn't need a variance. Back to thirty feet from the front, that wouldn't need a variance. But since it's, I mean, eight feet is pretty tall for dog containment purposes. Eight feet is actually the standard if you want to keep deer from jumping the fence. Deer are, generally speaking, much more agile in jumping fences than dogs. Even wolfhounds have a hard time with an eight-foot fence. So I'm kind of having a little bit of a, a uh, difficulty grasping why, why eight feet is, is allowable. Ms. Eldridge? I have, <clears throat> I have a question here that 
confused me a bit. It's an eight foot fence. I know that's too tall for the, but it said not adhering to the required yard setback. So it's not just the height. So it, he sh it should be so, inside. So a four foot fence can be in the front yard, doesn't have to adhere to front yards. And a six foot fence doesn't have to adhere to side and rear yards. So okay. it can be on the property line, but I'm, anything over that has to adhere to the yard requirements, the setbacks, essentially. Okay. I think okay. Okay. And I could believe that your neighbors are uh, okay with it because people do seem to love their fences in this neighborhood. Are we still in a public here? No, no. Um, we haven't opened it yet. Okay. Yeah, we haven't. We're just asking the yeah. applicant. Any other questions? Um, so, Mr. Brindamore, just a, a question. How big is your dog? <laughs> well, I mean, she's 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 six sixty seventy pounds. She's very active. She's run away a couple times. <laughs> uh, we've got her back. I know the, the Department of Par Public Works is sort of back there. Uh, we've we've had to find her a couple of times, but uh, you know, really, you know, with with the amount of fence we have at that tall, um, to go eight to six, it just is less uh, burdensome to go to eight to six to four. Uh, you know. So it really, it is simp a, a large part of it is, you know, when we bought the home, it was here. We we like it. It's functional. Um, we've talked to people about reusing it. Um, you know, we're not we're not wasteful people, <laughs> uh, and it just sort of seems seems logical and common sense for us to reuse. And the height is the height, uh, and so that is sort of what prompted a lot of this. It, it seems silly to not to reuse it. And it'd be quite unattractive to sort of have it be multiple multiple heights you know okay thank you are there any more questions from the board mm -hmm. okay so at this point i'll open the public hearing is there anyone here who would like to speak to for or against the application don't all rush uh is there anyone on zoom no. okay and seeing no one rise i'll close the public hearing and i'll turn it over to the board for its consideration Yeah, just to provide some clarity, I think on this, um, when I first started on the zoning board, uh, we didn't have any, there was nothing in the zoning ordinance that talked about heights of fences. Um, that did get added by the planning board, I think based off of a, a few different things that had occurred and some concerns that came up in, in far more enclosed spaces than, than what we're looking at with this applicant, where people were putting up like some pretty tall fences and some pretty compact um, uh, properties that you know good fences make good neighbors but really tall fences sometimes can also be you know somewhat intimidating and we also didn't want i think the four feet for the front yard kind of came from a desire not to have like a wall right we didn't we didn't want you to have your walled off compound that you were living in behind um we're starting to see some of that in, in certain areas as well so i think that's the genesis of some of this uh height requirement uh, so I just want to give the, the board that perspective. I mean, I, I think in a large property like this with, you know, a fair di division between properties, uh, the, the difference between a six foot or an eight foot fence is, is probably not that tremendous. Um, if the applicant wants to, you know, seems to be making a reasonable use of different heights of fencing for, for appro appropriate purposes in, in my impression. So anyone else? <clears throat> Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll just add that I, I imagine the intent was also in terms of uh, so-called spite fences, and this certainly yes. doesn't, doesn't seem to be a, a spite yes. fence, so that's worth considering. And it, it is a very public house. It's on busy streets, so in this case, it seems to make sense that the former owners put up a tall fence for some privacy. It's not taking light from anybody. It is a big open area, so. Anyone else? I'm good. Um, I will not be supporting the application because <laughs> I don't think that the applicant has demonstrated hardship. And I think, as Mr. Rayum has described the history of the zoning ordinance, it's clear. So, but anyway, um, uh, do I have a motion uh, from anyone? Don't look this way because I'm not supporting it either. Yeah. Well, that could be well, a motion. 
That's what we do like the cherry motion. <laughs> What's a hardship? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it seems like there's some flux, so perhaps a little bit more discussion or if, any, is, if anybody's ready for a motion, we'll certainly entertain it. <laughs> so moved. Hey, my, my dog, I think my dog is in support. Uh, you yeah. <laughs> well, you wanted the motion. Yeah. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll, uh, for the purposes of moving this, this along so we can get on to our next case, I will uh, make a motion to approve as presented and advertised. And do I hear a second? I'll second. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Ram, your motion. All right, thank you. Um, so granting the variance would not be uh, contrary to the public interest. So what are the public interests uh, here? Um, you know, general conditions of the neighborhood. Um, again, we were talking about a relatively large lot with um, substantial separation between this, um, this house and its neighbors. Um, a, a six foot fence would be allowed by right. We're talking about two additional feet. Um, again, over the course of a, of a long distance, I just don't think that uh, the net effect out of that would be substantial. Um, there is, um, you know, someone going by still from, from um, you know, the Greenland Road, which is actually sort of now partially truncated off. And of course the newer road is, is uh, even farther away and, uh, um, you know, is, is a sense of noise, uh, a source of noise, although I don't think the uh, eight foot fencing is going to help the applicant very much in, in that regard. But um, in, in terms of um, a, a, the public saying, hey, you know, this, this fence is, is bothersome to me in general, I, I don't see where that would be the case for this two foot difference. And um, there is indication that, um, that you know, neighbors also uh, would be in favor uh, of supporting additional privacy. Um, as noted, even with dogs and kids and whatnot, I mean, there is a, a noise element associated with that, that uh, just a little bit of, of additional fencing could p potentially help with uh, ameliorating some of that or, or the visual nature of, of some of that. Um, Grand variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance again. Um, you know, for a long time, we didn't control fences at all. We put it in place to really kind of prevent what was, I think, Possibly to properly, uh, excuse me, properly termed as spite fences um, amongst neighbors. Uh, don't certainly don't see anything along those lines occurring here. There is a, a, a an existing fence already uh, that the applicant is trying to take advantage of. So um, I, I do believe that it's trying to meet what we were originally hoping for when the uh, when this ordinance was created. Uh, granting the variance would do substantial justice. So what is the public's um, benefit that they would get that would outweigh the applicant's desire to have the higher fences <coughs> to, uh, uh, you know, ensure that additional privacy over long distances, again, um, from sight lines and perspectives and whatnot. Uh, I don't think there is anything, especially in this sort of wide open neighborhood where uh, the public would be gaining any benefit that would outweigh uh, what the uh, applicant would be uh, gaining. So I think they win that balancing test. Um, granting the variance would not diminish the values of surrounding properties. Um, again, with uh, with the large lots that are involved here and the and the ultimately the amount of fencing, I don't think that uh, that there's a concern with a loss of property values, and no indication that anyone from the from the neighborhood or the public in general thinks that that would be the case either. So this this so hardship. What do we have for hardship that that is coming in here? So um, again, special conditions. Um, this is an ordinance that applies all across the city, right? We have, it's, it's not just like an SRB, it's not just like a, a GRA. This is a fence ordinance all across the city. So when we put this in place, um, you know, you're talking about itty bitty little properties to relatively large properties. Um, in Portsmouth, you don't, the itty bitties tend to uh, way outweigh the, the fairly large properties. So I do think in terms of applying it back towards the ordinance, that the one of the conditions that we have here is, is this is probably essentially one of the bigger lots that you're gonna find um, in Portsmouth. And so in some ways diminishes some of the impact of this very broadly, broad brushly applied uh, requirement uh, out of our ordinance. So I, I do think that that is a, that is a factor here. Um, the applicant has indicated that they do have um, 
uh, you know, a, a long-standing fence that was there, again, a, a use that has been in, in place for a long time without seemingly causing negative aspects to um, harm on either side of the fence where either neighbor was, was concerned about it, the general public was concerned about it. So I think with that, um, there's, there's no substantial relationship between trying to say that reducing this down by two feet in those areas is going to make that big of a difference considering the, the, the breadth and scope and size of the property. And with that, I think it's reasonable and, uh, and should be approved. Thank you. Anything to add, Ms. Eldridge? No, he convinced me and I have nothing <laughs> to add. <laughs> okay, anything else from any members of the board? Okay. Uh, Mr. Mantle. Yes. I'm sorry, I should say the motion is to approve uh, the variance as presented in advertising. Mr. Mantle is a yes. Oh, in that case, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ram. Yes. Ms. Eldridge. Yes. Mr. Rossi. No. Mr. Matson. Yes. And the chair votes now. Motion passes for, oh, he's over there. <laughs> motion passes four to two. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> the next application is the request of Paul and Joe Lewinsky for property located at 187 Union Street, whereas relief is needed for renovation of the existing dwelling, including demolition of a small addition and expanding the existing structure, which requires the following. One, a variance from section 10.521 to allow a zero secondary front yard where two feet per section 10.516.10 is required. Two, a variance from section 10.321 to allow a non-conforming structure or building to be extended, reconstructed, or enlarged without conforming to the requirements of the ordinance. Said property is located on Assessor Map 135, Lot 68, and lies within the General Residency District. Mm. And who is here to speak to this application? Uh, I am Joe Lewinsky, owner of uh, 187 Union, along with my wife Paula of 35 years. We moved from Pennsylvania. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the committee and I want to thank our neighbors, our new neighbors, um, Crystal and Carrie for uh, <laughs> showing up and supporting us. Um, thank you. You probably feel like you've been here 35 years. Today. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, lovely, lovely town. Um, so I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I think the um, our, our project uh, requires us to um, rebuild a, um, a structure that is um, essentially wood on uh, on the ground um, and it is um, uh, essentially subterranean of the, the Coffins Court um, road level that um, it, it really is um, underpinning the road surface with its uh, its wood foundation so that needs to be replaced and um, and shored up um, and in doing so we're going to be um, raising the um, the structure two feet to bring the roof lines together with the second um, section of the, of the house along Coffins Court. And uh, that's essentially a, that part of the project that is um, we're seeking relief for. Um, the variance would not be contrary to public interest. Um, it would be improvements would be good for the road surface of Coffins Court and uh, would also improve um, the, 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 the water um, uh, re repelling um, into our basement um, because it's kind of drawing, it's, it's a siphon of, uh, of water into um, the crawl space area in the second structure and into the basement of the first structure. Um, the spirit of the ordinance will be observed. We're, we're remaining within the zero foot setback that is uh, grandfathered in and um, we're not extending the, uh, the structure along Coffins Court. We're only going up um, in height. Um, substantial justice will be done, we believe. Um, uh, the values of the surrounding properties will not be diminished. We believe our project will improve the values of the properties um, in the neighborhood. Um, literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance um, would, would result in an unnecessary hardship, we believe. Um, with the zero, the second front um, setback that were afforded on Coffins Court and the zero setback that exists um, kind of puts us in a tight bind um, that we're trying to uh, deal with um, fairly. Any questions? <clears throat> Any 
questions from the board? Mr. Ryan? Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, do you have a, I'm looking through your package and there's certainly a lot of lines that are being drawn here that kind of act like they are survey marked lines, but has there actually been a survey done of the property to validate the zero foot line? Uh, no, I, we, uh, we're going off the, uh, I guess the GPS maps that, um, we were, um, guided by the, uh, public works department. Okay. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, this is a really interesting neighborhood. Um, there's buildings in here. Well, uh, that, that certainly butt right up against, um, property lines, streets, etc. Uh, I guess a question for city staff, a follow up, if I may, uh, do, is this going to trigger uh, the need for a survey? I know in some other applications that we've had, we've said for really tight property lines when they're, they ultimately um, end up getting a survey. You, like for the foundation? Yeah. Just built? Um, or because there's no found, I wasn't sure if, if we're not doing yeah, foundation two, work. Two of the structures point. have proper foundations, if you can call them proper, um, with you know, stone and, and, and the brick. Uh, this this section does not have a proper foundation. It's, right, so you're going to be installing a foundation, yes. is that correct? Correct. Right. correct. So would, so, that, would I mean, that trigger? That's typically in, com in consultation with the inspections department. Um, yeah. And it likely will get a, get an as-built. Um, yeah, I would, I would expect to have someone inspect the, the, uh, yeah. the, foundation. Um, the foundation. Just for the um, pouring. For this addition. Correct. The, the addition other, that runs along Coffin Right, Court. the other part of the project right. that doesn't need relief yeah. likely will not the garage. Right, but but that could trigger that we need to validate that line from a right. surveyor right. standpoint, correct? Right. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Peter. I, or, uh, sorry, I don't know if there's any other. I'm sorry, could you just stay up here just in case there's sure. any I, other I also questions. want to thank Peter uh, for helping us uh, with our um, our application. So very helpful. And I guess my question to Peter might also then go to you is uh, if the uh, addition along Coffin's Court were reconstructed or uh, just rebuilt and it was set two feet from Coffin's Court so it met that setback, would it still need a variance because the rest of the home is uh, zero feet? Uh, no. If that portion that they're working on was moved in two feet, then they could use that that averaging of the existing alignments. Oh, the averaging. Right, okay. which is what, so normally it's a five foot setback. <clears throat> yes. But taking the average, it, it ends up being two, yeah. um, but they're right on the line. Even, even so though the, 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 main the, the main right. dwelling is non-conforming, though. So, the main dwelling is non-conforming, so, but that's. The main dwelling is non-conforming, but that's not being. Um, altered? Altered. Okay. Uh, so I guess my question to you is, did you consider uh, when you rebuilt, when you demolished the cold storage, if you, when you rebuilt, that uh, small rear addition, just moving it two feet um, uh, from Coffin's Court. Yeah, we, we actually considered that, but uh, we, from a, an aesthetic um, perspective, we decided to keep uh, it along Coffin's Court uh, and uh, with the, the rest of the building, mm -hmm. keep the same line. Okay. Are there any other mm -hmm. questions? Okay. Um, I'll open the public hearing. If there's anyone here who would like to speak to, for, or against this application, uh, please come to the podium. Might as well. <laughs> Been sitting here for that long. I know. Um, my name is Carrie Feingold. I live at 199 Union Street, so I am the, a butter right alongside. Um, and this is just a I mean, I feel like the need for the variance is such a little sort of piece of what is a really big project. And so, you know, it, it seems to make sense to go with the aesthetic of keeping it where it is. Um, it's, you know, just part of the growth and change that's happening in this neighborhood, in all of Portsmouth. And um, like I said, I don't think it's, it, it's such a, in the big scheme of what is gonna be developed and happening, I think it's a little sort of piece to it. And I think it's gonna, it's gonna be a big project and it's just, it's, I don't know, I think it's going to look great. So, um, I, sorry, I think it might have been coherent a little bit more a couple of hours ago. <laughs> That's all I've got for now. Same so. with us. Okay. <laughs> Done. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak to for or against the application? Okay. Is 
there anyone on Zoom? No. Nope. All right. So uh, with that, I'll close the public hearing and I'll await discussion or motion from the board. Mr. Mattel? Uh, I'll make a motion to uh, grant as um, presented. I'll second that. Your motion, Mr. Mattel? Uh, interesting house, and I've driven by it several times, but I had forgotten that there's a little road there. Um, yeah. Granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest. Um, it would not be. I find that, if anything, doing your improvements, um, especially on the side of the house, nice connection, uh, would be a benefit to the public interest. Um, granting the variance would observe the spirit of the ordinance. Yes, it would. As you said before, we're only asking for a two-foot variance for the back um, demolition of the house, whereas the entire rest of the house is going to be right there. So I agree with that assessment. Um, and to uh, granting the variance would do substantial justice, as I just said. It's a small request on uh, to line up with the rest of the house. Granting the variance would do substantial justice. Um, granting the variance would not diminish the values of the surrounding property. If anything, the surrounding properties would increase in value just from the proposal you're doing. As I said, it's a unique property um, from just its location on Union Street, but its location on the corner of Union Street and a public access way makes it even more unique. Uh, and to that effect, going into the hardship provision, the property has special conditions that distinguish it from other properties in the area. That is true. Owing to these special conditions, fair and substantial relationship does not exist between the general public purposes of the ordinance provisions and the specific application of that provision to the property. And the proposed use is a reasonable one. I agree. It is, and I believe that the, that hardship does exist because of the special conditions of this house. And any additions to that? I would just add that uh, with regard to uh, observing the spirit of the ordinance, uh, the purpose of general residency is for uh, single family, two family, multifamily dwellings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, there's nothing about this plan that diminishes the suitability of the property to meet that purpose, and therefore uh, it does comply with uh, that requirement. And uh, with regard to special uh, conditions of the property, uh, the property already has zero clearance all the way up, uh, all the way up the, the uh, outline of the building along Coffin Street. Uh, and the only other thing I would add is if you find some General Motors blue paint on your little uh, chain link fence post, uh, can you please return it to me? I appreciate that. <laughs> <clears throat> it, is not a, it is not an alley that's suitable for, <coughs> for my vehicle. That's it. Are there any other additions? Or requests? <laughs> Mr. Ram? Uh, yeah, nothing about automotive paint here but um, I am going to be the I think I'm, I'm going to be the contrarian on this one Mr. Matson's line of questioning actually um, has me concerned I and I, I, I agree that it's only two feet but I think it's a really important two feet um, you know zero foot setbacks we try and avoid them wherever we can I mean the, the applicant really in this particular case is digging a brand new foundation. I think it's actually going to trigger uh, the need for a survey, which A, is going to cost money, and B, I'm not entirely cer certain that you're actually going to appreciate what you, what you find in the survey um, if, if you have to go and do that. Uh, personally, I think you'd be, you know, the aesthetic of sort of this continuing wall along the, uh, the streetscape, I don't think is all that critical for this relatively short little um, you know, stubby outcropping. It's a pantry and a laundry. I know you would lose like a couple feet of your cabinetry in your kitchen. Um, in, in that direction, you could maybe make up for it a little bit with a big lazy Susan or something on the other side. But uh, I just think that that 
a zero foot setback here when you could have a no need for variance whatsoever at the two foot mark is is a, a big enough ask that I'm, I'm going to vote against it. Okay. Any other comments, questions? All right. So the motion on the table is to approve the variance request as presented and advertised. Um, I'll start with Mr. Matson. Uh, yes. Mr. Rossi? Yes. Ms. Eldridge? Yes. Mr. Rayum? No. Mr. Mantle? Yes. And the chair votes yes. The application is approved by a vote of five to one. And Mr. Matson abandoned you. I'm just kidding, David. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> he left you out there and. <laughs> no. no that's All right. All right. So the next application, the next and final application is 4446 Rockingham Street. Mr. Rayum is recusing himself from this application. There are the hundreds. Um, and uh, while well, he's gathering himself up. So um, the request of Linda J. Mayran for property located sorry, at 4446 Rockingham Street, whereas relief is needed for, af for an after the fact variance for rear deck expansion and stairs which requires the following. One, variances from section 10.521 to allow A, an eight foot side yard where 10 feet is required, and B, 46% building coverage where 35% is the maximum allowed. Two, a variance from section 10.321 to allow a non-conforming building or structure to be extended, reconstructed, or enlarged without conforming to the requirements of the ordinance. Said property is located on assessor map 144, lot 14 and lies within the general residency district. And who speaks, who's speaking to this application? Thank you, board. My name is Brian Barrington of the Coolidge Law Firm. I spent 10 years as a city attorney for the city of Summersworth, so I apologize that my request for finding a fax follows the Summersworth order instead of your order, but I'll um, relay that over to your order. Um, Linda Mayran purchased this property in 1994. Um, this property was built in 1830. So the size of the structure, the setbacks, you'll notice that there's zero setbacks on either side. Um, and all we're talking about is a back porch. Um, the back porch is necessary because the way the slope of the property goes away from the building and there has to be ingress and egress to the back of the property for life and safety code reasons. Um, in, in fact, uh, back in 2002, um, at the time there was uh, permits and inspections, there was a, 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 a porch put in then, doors, it's a duplex, and so the doors are on either side. So the physical nature of the building uh, that's pre-existing can be part of your, your hardship um, criteria, and those doors require decks. Those decks must be big enough for life and safety code access so that the doors can swing open, especially if there's a fire and emergency. Also, the deck has to be big enough so in case there's any handicapped person living within the property that needs a wheelchair or a walker, they can't just have a door bounce against the banister. Um, when you look at the pictures, you can see that it's, it's very modest. These, these two doors on either side are pre-existing. The setbacks are really inconsequential. The, the lawn is actually fairly big uh, compared to the ones we've seen, but next to the city parking lot, when you look at this sketch, the, the one that's yellow, the city parking lot, it's eight feet instead of um, 10 feet, but it's eight feet to a city parking lot. So you're not talking about the porch being closer to a neighbor that's gonna cause any um, aggravation and then it's 13 feet on the other side. In terms of the size of the porch and the coverage, when you look at the picture, you see there's still an awful lot of backyard. So we're not talking like we did heard earlier where almost the entire backyard is being filled up with a porch. So let's go to the exact findings that are required. So my number two is your number one. Granting the variance will not be contrary to the public interest. The public interest for side lock setback is to protect the abutter um, to give air and space, as we've talked about. Here you have a parking lot. Um, it's obviously no one in the parking lot is gonna be offended because this deck is too close to the side. Uh, the public interest isn't gonna be offended. The public using the parking lot isn't gonna notice. 
Um, the second criteria is my number five, that granting the variance is not contrary to the spirit of the ordinance. The spirit of the ordinance, again, is to protect the butters from crowding from an outdoor deck. It's also the spirit of the ordinance is that um, you just don't just fill up your property with so much stuff. Um, I think we've all seen that it's very fashionable now to have some decks, and some of these decks seem to be the size of a football field coming out from the back of the house. This deck is proportionate to the size of the house, it's proportionate to the exits, um, and it's proportionate to what's required in order to have fair and safe access uh, from the building. Um, the third criterion of substantial justice, justice uh, would be allowed to uh, allow um, this to be there. The, the renovation plans were approved by the city. Um, this technicality was only discovered at the end of a two-year renovation process. She spent two years trying to get this one unit um, renovated, and then someone really as a complete afterthought did some math and figured, oh, you're off by 2%. Um, and, um, but the, 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 the layout of the decks is related to the doors. The doors is related to the building. The building is a duplex, and it's, <coughs> it's necessary. Um, the unnecessary hardship is owing to the special conditions of the property. Um, the Supreme Court has ruled if there's no fair and substantial relationship between the general public purpose and the ordinance and the specific. The ordinance indicates that the general public purpose is to protect the abutters, but there's no abutter impact. The proposed use is a reasonable one, the rear of the buildings. The, you know, reasonableness is something that goes to all the law. Reasonable allows it's defined simply as you have to have a reason. You have to have a reason for why you're doing what you're doing. What we're doing, what you're doing, is because it's a duplex, it has two exits, and the deck must be wide enough and deep enough to allow access and egress. So the unnecessary hardship is owing to special conditions of the property. The special conditions are, this, are the way this 1830, by the way, that was 1830s when this was built, um, it has been, and it has to be big enough to, to accommodate it. Um, and we feel, it, and then, and in terms of uh, number four, which is my number one, um, we don't see any um, effect on the abutting properties because the only abutting property that's affected by the deck is the parking lot. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions for this? Just one quick question. Could you? Run that by me again. How did it turn out to be an after-the-fact variance request? Clarify that so there's no mistake. This is Linda Mayran. Linda Mayran, owner of the property. In two, I'm going to say around 2002, and I'm not absolutely sure about that time frame. There was. Um, some taking down of horsehair plaster, putting up um, sheetrock between the two common units. There was just, I can tell you what I can remember. There were discussions with this, one of the city inspectors. I was trying to find his business card. I couldn't. Um, very helpful, explained the fire rated, the one hour fire rated sheetrock that needed to be up. And we had expanded the deck and moved the back door at that time. I had mistakenly, and this is ultimately on me, and I take full responsibility, I had given the card to the contractor. I thought the paperwork was done for the permitting. And when we started this um, process two years ago with the renovation of 46 Rockingham Street, it was discovered that the four-foot extension of the back deck that happened around 2002 there's no paperwork to it. I don't have it. The city doesn't have it. I, all I have is the business card, which I can't even find that at this point. So that's why it's an after the fact. So again, my apologies. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for staying so late. Um, I, there's no one here, but I will open the public hearing if there's anyone here to speak to for or against the application. No one's here. Is there anyone on Zoom? Just us. Just us. <laughs> 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 no, 
no one speak. No. <laughs> um, so I will close the public hearing and I will ask for the board's discussion or a motion. I move to approve the variance as uh, submitted and advertised. And do I hear a second? A second. Second by Ms. Eldridge. Uh, Mr. Rossi, your motion? Yeah, um, I'm trying to even scratch my head about what relevant fact would uh, apply to diminishing, uh, or grant, sorry. Want me to do this? Yeah, go ahead. Did, did you second this one? I did second. Okay, yes. I'm Thank never I am seconding so, one of your I'm, motions. I'm again. sorry, I am so tired. <laughs> Don't hold it against me. <laughs> Granting the variance would not be contrary to the public interest, and it would observe the spirit of the ordinance. Um, you know, the deck needs to be there. The <laughs> doors are up high. If this person wants to leave our house, she needs to build a deck. And um, we're only talking about a 2 percentage difference, increase in the building coverage. Um, I can't see how this would be contrary to the public interest. And it's also behind the house. It's behind the, right. It's not, it's, it is covering the lot more, but it is not taking up a huge part of the lot. There's the plenty of open space and the neighbor is the parking garage. The do you want to do lot. this? It's not your motion, Mr. Mantle. <laughs> um, granting the variance would do substantial justice. Clearly, the deck is an essential part of the structure, and the size of the deck, um, a smaller deck will not allow for safety concerns. Um, granting the variance will not diminish the values of surrounding properties. The deck has been there, and there is no reason why anyone would think that this would take away. Um, literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance would result in an unnecessary hardship. 2% is a very slight change to the property coverage, and the size of the decks are necessary to the safety of the residents of the building. And I think that the hardship is that in order to create a deck that meets those safety standards, the lot coverage is Increases. And therefore, I think that we should approve this request. That's, Mr. Rossi, would you like to add anything to your motion? That's the best <laughs> motion I've ever crafted. <laughs> I am really impressed with my motion. I think we're getting a little slack. Yes, we are. Okay, um, Eddie, f f would you like to add anything? No, no, I have nothing to add. Thank you. <laughs> Any further consideration or, or discussion? Okay, then I will call the question. The uh, motion on the table is to approve as presented and advertised. Mr. Mantle. Yes. Mr. Rayum is recused. Um, Ms. Eldridge. Yes. Mr. Rossi. Yes. Mr. Matson. Yes. And the acting chair votes yes. The motion to approve is granted by a vote of five to zero. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Tell somebody. Um, so anyway, uh, our business is conducted. So uh, I would just need a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. We are adjourned. Bye. You too.